City Council meeting for Thursday, October 27th to order. And can we all uh, stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sue, can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Norton. Councilmember Harlan. Here. Councilmember Bertrand. Here. Councilmember Termini. Here. Mayor Botorf. Here. Um, we get a report on closed session from the uh, city attorney. Yes, thank you. There are two items uh, discussed in closed session this evening. First was real property negotiations concerning the property at 4400 Jade Street. And uh, the parties were the city and the SoCal Union Elementary School District. Council received a report from its ne uh, negotiator, the city manager, and gave direction, but there was no reportable action on that. Second item was a conference with legal counsel concerning pending litigation, the case of Water Rock versus the city of Capitola. Uh, the council received a status report from the city attorney, but there was no reportable action. Thank you for that report. Uh, Sue, so do we have any additional materials tonight? Uh, yes, we have five additional materials, and um, they're all in front of you there. And one of them is a revised staff report for item 8B regarding the Village Parklet pilot program. Thank you. Mr. City Manager, any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay, that brings us to the public comment part of the evening. This is a time when uh, people from the community are allowed to come and talk to the city council on any issue that is not on the agenda. So if you'd like to come up and uh, tell us who you are, we'd appreciate that. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor Badorf and uh, Capitola City Council members. My name is Marshall Torrey. I'm Development uh, Director for the Summer Hill Homes. Uh, the Summerhill Housing Group has been uh, a proud builder for, uh, for sale and for rent communities in the Bay Area for 40 years. And tonight I also represent the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, which includes more than 400 of Silicon Valley's most respected employers on issues that affect the economic health and quality of life in Silicon Valley and the vicinity. The Leadership Group is promoting the Applied Materials Silicon Valley Turkey Trot occurring, occurring on November 24th, Thanksgiving Day, a series of running walking events centered around a 5K and 10K course and a kids' fun run. All proceeds from the race go to local benef beneficiaries, including the Second Harvest Food Bank of Santa Cruz County, the Healthier Kids Foundation, the Housing Trust, and the Health Trust. This year, we're expecting over 25,000 registered runners. Turkey Trot is fun for runners and walkers of all ages and speeds. And with easy public transportation and parking, runners are out and back in time to celebrate Thanksgiving with their families. In addition, city council members, city managers, and mayors are all eligible to participate in the Summerhill Housing Group Mayor's Cup. The Mayor's Cup competition pits Bay Area city councils against one another in a challenge to determine which city boasts the highest participation for its size category. You can also participate remotely if you are traveling so you can still register and help your city gain points. Uh, the Mayor's Cup is awarded to the municip municipality with the highest percentage of registration points. Registration must be completed by November 21st at noon. So how do you participate? You go to www.svturkeytrot.com, select the Mayor's Cup category under the non-time categories and choose your city when registering. Please also encourage other elected officials to attend this spirited competition that is based on participation and not speed. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great holiday season. And I provided a little bit of information about the turkey trot for each of the council people. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Appreciate that presentation. I know we did that one year, so uh, thank you for coming and uh, reminding us. Thanks so much. Anyone else like to address the council? Gary Ridgerald, Mayor, Councilman. Uh, presently, there's a massive violation of oath by the counties and cities throughout the Ambag area. Uh, what the people don't know is that they're creating a new structure above 
the local sovereign uh, organizations in which we elect you uh, from we people, we're your constituents. What's happening is that the AMBAG, and I think there's 18 out of the 21 entities in AMBAG that have already approved setting up a uh, joint power organization um, which is surrendering your sovereignty. Uh, it includes ICLE, which is a front for both the World Bank and the United Nations that has contracts with. Uh, PG&E, of course, is part of it. If you go to the uh, letters S-E-E-C, uh, people can go on site, that's S-E-E-C, they'll find the emblem of ICLE on the left-hand top corner. So the World Bank and the United Nations is grabbing a hold of the power situation out of this whole three areas. Um, it turns out, uh, according to their plan, you will just have one vote out of 16 or so, so you're totally surrendering your authority in this, uh, this regional uh, imposition. The elected people, you, will have one member attending this, uh, this cadre that has assumed all of this power. You, so you have no oversight. You only have one guy going, and, re and presently you're not reporting back what's going on in Ickley, or these people would be out here with pitchforks. Um, the elected people meet twice a year for this, uh, this new power agency. And what happens is that the city managers and the CAOs of the counties meet eight times a year. So you've got no oversight. You're surrendering this to an outfit. You should have seen the, the people advocating over at San Benito County, uh, telling them uh, how wonderful this is going to be because they're going to be able to uh, not burn coal or, you know, they're going to help in climate warming. And that is an absolute fraud. In fact, that's exactly if you go to the... Uh, the computer, you'll, you'll find one, one guy going up there. I mean, it was like taking candy away from a baby. One guy goes, well, you know, maybe it's good for global warming. Um, it's outrageous. You're being screwed by the international bankers, and some of you know it. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Anyone else like to address the council? Come on up, Pam. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Pam Greninger. It's so nice to see all of you. Um, I have some museum board news. Our um, museum board was selected by the Shadowbrook Restaurant to participate in their Community Tuesday. And what that means is all proceeds from sales on November the 1st, which is next Tuesday, will go to the Capitola Historical Museum. And as you know, this has been an exciting year for the museum because we celebrated our 50th birthday, having uh, opened our doors back in uh, 1966. So anyway, I have some flyers here about, about the event. Um, and we'd love for you all to come and uh, spread the news to your friends and neighbors and and, uh, and when you make your reservations, say you're dining on behalf of the museum. Thanks Hope so you much. all can come. Yeah, thank you, Pam. <clears throat> Hello, Kristen. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I just wanted to take this time uh, to let the community know about a meeting that's coming up shortly, uh, also on November 1st. Uh, that evening at 7 o'clock, the Friends of the Capitola Branch Library is holding a community input session so that people can give uh, their ideas and input on what they want in their new library. On our October 22nd Friends of the Capitola Branch Library meeting, we had a presentation um, from other members who took tours of other libraries and came back with some really great ideas. Um, but of course, we'd love to have the input of the community. And if anyone's available, I would encourage them to uh, come to the meeting uh, at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, November 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Well, question, Kristen. The, the meeting's located at? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. It's at the library. Uh, of course. At the whole library. Thank you for that. You're the Anybody else like to address the council of public comment? Okay, we'll go ahead and close the uh, public comment period. Move to uh, City Council comments. Yes, we have our 
famous Halloween parade taking place this Sunday. Um, we're queuing up at 1.30 in the afternoon on Sunday, rain or shine. It will happen. Get in your best costumes. Come on out. And the, the parade will kick off exactly at 2. We will have, I believe, Soak Hill High is bringing their incredible marching band. So it will be quite the parade. Come on down and see us. Great. John? Stephanie? The Seniors Council Area Agency on Aging, Aging met last week, and um, we had a good meeting and um, are um, trying to work hard to pass Measure D because that was something that the um, Seniors Council got involved in this year was to try to reallocate the funding for Measure D to have more funding go for the paratransit and the um, uh, uh, transit services for elderly and disabled people. So they bumped up those numbers. So. Uh, the um, board members and of uh, the um, um, of the area agency on aging, aging and the advisory council are trying to help pass Measure D because those those monies will help um, the funding for paratransit use in the county. Friends of SoCal Cemetery met last week also here in uh, Capitola uh, uh, community room, and we received a very interesting update from a representative from Temple Bethel. And they've been working hard to clean up the cemetery and get it in much better shape. It had a lot of garbage and trash and so forth on the property. There was a squatter on the property. They've removed um, most of the stuff that was dumped there. They're going to at some point put, <clears throat> put a little bit more fencing or chain around the area so cars can't get drive into there and just dump their, their truck a load of junk in, in there. And, um, but they have a list of, of all the plots. They're looking into getting an underground x-ray um, machine that Evergreen Cemetery actually used at one time. It's very expensive. But that way you can see what's buried underground. And they have found a crypt that has quite a number of bodies in it. And it's buried about 10 feet, I think, underground. And they don't know exactly who it is and what it is and so forth. But they're going to be borrowing this or renting it or buying it or something, this, this piece of equipment, so they can look and see and really get a, a real good sense of, of who's there and, um, take, and take really, really good care of it. So there's an endowed area and a non-endowed area. But if, if you want to take an interesting walk sometime, go up there and walk around because there's a lot of Capitola folks up there. And I'm hoping at some point that the city will have a partnership with the temple and with the friends of the Soquel Cemetery to help them because it is our cemetery too. A lot of our folks are resting there. So that's all for now. Thanks. That machine has the ability to tell who the person is? No, but it can see <laughs> whether there's a, a body, a body. It's a, what's, it, what's it called, Steve? You know what it's called? It's an x ray machine. Ground, that ground penetrating x ray. Ground penetrating x ray. Right. Right. Very interesting. Wow. To see how big things Easy are way. and what's down there. Yeah. Very interesting. I just wanted a quick announcement tonight. There was another uh, South Bay arrival meeting in Palo Alto. Uh, that meeting was about the jet noise that's been uh, plaguing Santa Cruz County for the past uh, oh, year and a half. And the update today was today was a uh, session where after people listening patiently to the committee trying to come up with a resolution, it was a public comment period. And uh, when I left at 4 o'clock to make this meeting, they were still having public comment. It's probably still going on right now. There was probably 300 people in the room. Uh, that committee will be winding down in the next three weeks, and we expect a decision, a conclusion. Hopefully there will be a regional consensus that comes out of that, and uh, possibly people in Santa Cruz County can start to see a little relief. Um, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Um, jumping in here. I actually thought this was kind of important to tell people about. So I was just at the uh, Regional Climate Action Conference, and a lot of things were, you know, presented to the group of new developments, but there was one that was particularly important. And the reason why this is particularly important is because it's going to change uh, how agriculture is done in terms of sequestering carbon. So there will probably be more on this, but it involves um, altering uh, how you graze, uh, how you fertilize and the timing of grazing and such. So it was very important because um, the amount of carbon sequestered went from 12 to a uh, you know, rather large percent. I don't think it was over 20. I, you know, I can't remember all the details. But it was significant. And there's uh, plots that are being uh, actually done right now around California, about uh, 30 or so plots. 
And the program that's putting this together is actually going to be doing this around the world so that you can have a carbon sequestering projects that are basically going to change how agriculture is carried out to sequester carbon. And it's significant. It's so significant that some of the scientists that are working on this actually indicate that it's going to have an appreciable effect on what the carbon is in the air right now. So it's a different way of looking at farming. It's probably going to be in the news uh, eventually as soon as these early results come in. Thanks. Uh, we'll move to staff comments. City Clerk, you have a comment? Yes, I do. Thank you. At the end of every year, uh, several, several of the terms on the city boards and commissions expire. So we have uh, open recruitment on several committees, such as the uh, Ar Architectural and Site Review Committee, the Art and Cultural Commission, the Commission on the Environment, the Finance Advisory Committee, the Library Advisory Committee, Traffic and Parking, and Planning Commission. So if anyone's interested, please contact the city clerk's office or look online. Thank you. Thank you for that update. City Manager. I don't think I have any updates, but I think our Public Works Director has a quick little update on some of our CIP projects. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I uh, just wanted to give a quick update on the Park Avenue, Kennedy Drive, and Monterey Avenue paving. Uh, we had hoped they'd be starting next week, but due to the rain, They've been delayed on other projects, so we were now pushed back. They'll be starting the week of November 7th. Uh, most of the early work you'll see is they'll be going out and doing all the conform grinding up and down every street. Uh, the heavy paving, the, the pavement recycling, and the paving on top of that uh, is looking like it's going to start toward the end of that week and early the week of the 14th and go be done by the 18th at this point. That's our schedule. Um, during that time, what we see now has been minor inconveniences. We will have roads closed with no traffic permitted on them, uh, no parking on the streets. So we ask that the community uh, help us out as much as they can and get their cars out of the area and don't plan to be from 8 to 5 on uh, the days those blocks are closed. So um, we're getting close, and it will be one week of uh, some ma major inconvenience. Yeah, that's a great project, Steve. I think that uh, the community is going to be happy to have that done. And, uh and they've been waiting a long time, so thanks for that update. Okay. Um, That's question. going to have an influence on the school delivery, too. Yes, it will. Yeah. Uh, okay. you know, we'll, either Monterey Avenue or Park Avenue will be open, but uh, when we're paving Monterey Avenue, there's uh, going to be little or no access to the drop-off area off of Monterey, and we're, we're working with the school district to get the words out to their parents up for those days. Okay. Are we going to notice the uh, area, uh, the yeah, McCormick the Triangle neighborhood, too? Okay. The contractor will be handing out notices. Um, the McCormick Triangle, uh, we've sent them a notice of the project, uh, but their parking won't be impacted, and they just will have the traffic delays. So yeah. um, I can put out another notice to them if you'd like. But the contractor will be handing out notices to every property in that area with specifics about when they can't park okay. in, in the area. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for that update. All right, that brings us to the uh, consent calendar. These are items we usually deal with all in one motion. Uh, is there anybody from the council like to pull anything on the consent calendar? Move the consent. Second. Anybody from the public like to pull anything from the consent calendar? Dennis, even check. Number A. Number A. Okay, we'll, we'll pull that up. Would you, would you have a question, specific question on A? Uh, come a up 30, to the. A 30 second, come on up to the, come on up to the podium. Let us know what you. Uh, Thank you, Gary, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, under communications and a lot of the entities throughout the AMBAG area, uh, the minutes only reflect the number of people that attended oral communications. Like tonight it would say three. And I think it would be the responsibility of the clerk uh, to include, whether it's persons identified or unknown, put uh, individual concerning corruption or parking or, or flooding or something like that. But the, the people themselves are being totally uh, totally dismissed, and it's like they were never there. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Mr. Sidger, what's our practice on how we note, make notations on uh, items that are referenced? The, the council has a discretion, some discretion as to what uh, is included in the minutes in addition to the specific items of business that were discussed and the and the votes that were taken on those but that's the main point of the 
of the minutes is to record the official business of the city council. So, um, so while um, it could be the practice to list individuals' names, that there's no requirement to do so. What's well, our past practice, there, Mr. City Manager? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my city clerk can correct me if I'm wrong, but we do list the names of the individuals who provide testimony of public comment, provided they either say their name clearly into the microphone or they, they enter their name, um, only in the cases when people either decline to state their name or say it in a way that the clerk can't interpret later. So uh, in this case, the reason why there's no names listed is there's no public comment. Okay, great. Thank you for that uh, comment. All right, we have a motion and a second. I want to revise my motion quickly. Um, uh, the uh, Santa Cruz Regional 911. I will not be voting for that. 84782? Eight eight yes. Okay. So, uh, that's a no vote on that. In, uh, so we'll vote on every item but that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously with the opposition to that one section. So you got that uh, notation? Okay. Good. All right. That brings us to the uh, general government public hearing. And our first report is a receiver report on the widening of the Capitola Wharf and a 10 year schedule of improvements. Steve Jesper. Again, good evening, Mayor and Council. The item before you, uh, we actually started working on this in the uh, beginning of this calendar year. In February of this year, the Council received a report, a condition assessment of the report, and also some strategies for uh, reinforcing the wharf so we're not so vulnerable to a single piling going down and closing down the whole wharf while we get it repaid and having to do an emergency contract for $50,000 to redrive a, a wharf, um, to redrive a pile. What came out of that was uh, interest in reinforcing or fortifying the wharf by uh, doing a widening on the wharf. Um, and quickly I'll run through, I can get this going. So as we go through this report, I just wanted to uh, refresh us on different terms we'll be using. Um, starting at the beach end, which is the left end here, we have the, the shore end. We have this narrow section that leads out to the outer part that's called the trestle area. This is where we're most vulnerable because we have three pilings supporting each bent. Um, we lose one of those pilings, typically that shuts the wharf down. Anyway, as we move out and south onto the wharf, we have the head. And this is the, uh, the point of the wharf. Um, there's some structural elements in here, probably not critical. We go through those, but if we want to reference those, we can. <coughs> Just to give a timeline of danger, this only goes back to 1980. Um, but in 1980, the wharf had some damage. In 82, uh, it was overtopped. We've replaced 60 pilings back then. Uh, and then we had to rebuild the south end or the head of the wharf is when we put the steel pilings in was in 83 following the 82 damage. Had a pretty good uh, period here. I'm sure we did some piling replacements in there, but then again in 94, the deck was overtopped. Um, in 1999, we did the major rebuild at the shore end where we widened that and put in uh, the concrete piles that are there. And then uh, again, the deck was over. Uh, was overtopped in 2003. It um, bent 12 and other places that were required us to shut down the wharf while we redid it. We've had more uh, trestle damage. We replaced uh, seven piles in 2009 and uh, did some utility upgrades to the sewer system to try and protect it by putting an ejector guard in. And just even this year, we had one pile that uh, was taken out. Uh, fortunately, we were able to build a strengthening beam over the top of it, so we haven't done a pile replacement there yet. Um, the picture is a little hard to see, but you can see all the colored circles are the piles that we've replaced since 2000. I mean, since 1980. I apologize. Um, they're kind of scattered. You have a lot out here. The ones at the head and the, in the white area of the wharf have never resulted in a closure of the wharf. Uh, we've been able to either sister it or come back and, and wait until there's several of them to do a piling replacement. It's the ones in this area that cause us the most trouble. It's, it's narrow, like I've already stated, and, and usually results in a, at least a temporary closure. Uh, back in the beginning of this year, the wharf was found to be in fair to good condition. You can see the, the wood pilings are narrowing at the water line, which is pretty typical as they get eaten and corroded away. Here you can see the three pile bents that we have going through the trestle area. Out on the outer end, uh, the steel piles at, at the end um, are corroded through. Really, this isn't structurally because this is all a, a um, 
linear loading on these. Uh, there's no deflection really at, at these piles. So these piles structurally are, are able to carry the load without any problem, but obviously at one point they will rust through and uh, need to be replaced. So looking at the next 10 years um, and how we want to plan do improvements here, uh, our recommendation is as follows, and I'll be going through these. Annually, we do an inspection of the steel piles for the next couple of years. Uh, we anticipate it take three years to put a pile replacement project together there. Um, then in year three, we come back and actually replace the steel piles and several other piles that um, we know are in, in the wood piles that need to be replaced. Uh, that's estimated to cost $300,000. You can see the steel piles are here, and then there's piles here where these blue dots are that need replacing. We would do that as one project that would go out to bid. This also showed the steel piles. You can see the corrosion that's occurring on those. Uh, the big item, which is what uh, the resiliency plan came up with, was to widen the wharf. We decided that was the best way to uh, protect the wharf uh, from the periodic closures we're going through, and it would be to widen it in this blue area from the shore end where we have the widened opening all the way out to the, the head of the wharf. Um, this would provide us, if we go to this next section, we'd go from three piles in this area to six piles in that area. The handrail would obviously be moved out. Um, and we could also look at the surfacing here. One of the issues we have is uh, ADA compliance um, going out in the wharf. It's too rough a surface right now, so we could look at some alternate surfaces, at least on half of the new half, or maybe we extend it over those. Things we haven't looked at, but this is the scheme of what we, we estimate. We, at the same time um, that we do this, let me go back a couple, I'm sorry. We would include uh, utility relocations right now the gas main sits on top of the deck about th two years ago, I'm sure you remember. The gas line, which was under the deck at that time, got damaged, um, and we had to replace the whole thing. So we replaced it, and now sits on top of the deck. We haven't any problems with that. Our sewer, water, and electrical lines continue to run under the deck, and we continue to have problems with that. So we would, as part of this reconstruction of, and widening of the wharf, we would find a, what we would relocate all the utilities to above the deck. And we'd also add a new restroom facility between the two buildings. So those three items come to about $3 million. Then in year, uh, after that, we, would, uh, we anticipate we're still going to lose some piles, but hopefully at this point it won't result in uh, closures. But we will have to do some uh, pile replacements, and we're, we're expecting to do maybe two of them for $100,000, uh, for $200,000 over 10 years. So again, looking at the long-term planning um, for the wharf, uh, we have steel pile inspections, replace the steel piles, widen the wharf, do the major remodel of the wharf, widening it, new bathrooms, uh, new decking, utility upgrades, and then we'll still have some storm damages and further inspections on the wharf. Um, with that, that concludes my report. Uh, Brad Porter from Moffitt Nickel Engineers, who prepared this report and has done all the studies, is in the audience. If you have any questions, all right, welcome back. Question: uh, There was mention in your report about um, cladding the west-facing piers that get the most. I think I got the direction correct. We don't. I don't see that as one of the options that we've taken. So that was one of the resiliency options that we looked at was taking where we have the three piles now, um, cladding those. I think the thought is with the six piles where we're going to widening it, if we even lose one of the outside ones, we're not going to result in a closure of the wharf. Um, certainly that's something we can look at as we finalize the scope of work. But we were just looking at all the resiliency options back then, and I think we at that time selected the widening. I'm also talking, thinking about at the wide part of the wharf, up ahead of the wharf, and we seem to have a significant number of pilings that are deteriorating more on the water line and the sand line. Right. We can consider cladding those as well. I know that was part of the, one of the no, situations that we spoke about last time. I'll ask Brad to uh, respond to that. Sure. Uh, I'm Brad Porter with Moffat Nickel, and, and I prepared, did the inspection and um, prepared those reports. Yeah, what you're talking about, at the end of the report, we had the fiberglass jackets. We did look at that. That was the report we did in, in the resiliency options. And <clears throat> we could do that, but the cost of doing that is about a million bucks. 
and it's still there's no guarantee that you're not going to lose um, that pile due to log wave damage in the winter. Whereas when you widen it, you've got three brand new piles, so you're you're getting a lot more resiliency for approximately the same cost. I'm not talking about an either or. I'm talking okay. about belt and suspenders. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we have a significant number of deteriorated piles at the head end of the wharf that perhaps cladding might be worthwhile in addition to the widening towards the, the narrow end of the wharf. I mean, you certainly could. The piles that were there, as were shown in the report, there's really only th your, your piles are in fairly good shape except for the steel piles. There was only three piles out there. Um, and we went out at a low tide and looked for the, there was only three piles out of the, there's what, 80 bents times, out of the four or 500 piles that are out there, there were only three of the timber ones and the three steel that were bad. So your piles are in actually fairly good shape. We could certainly put cladding on them. It's about $15,000 per pile to do it. So to do it over the, if you just did the west facing piles, you've got 80 bents, that's, um, I won't hold you to the math. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's uh, it's a lot of money. It is. We okay. can certainly we can certainly do that, but I think that the widening is more cost effective. But we could certainly, in addition, you're right. Not either or. We could certainly clad with the fiberglass jacketing over your existing timber piles to the cost of about a million dollars. Could you elaborate on the surfacing of the uh, planking, which is even though we've done it not too long ago. You know, because of the gaps that have formed and the inconsistencies of it, what's the intelligent technology today for the wharf surface? Well, okay. As far as the gaps are concerned, if you're if you're going to be using you know Douglas fir timber decking, which is kind of the standard for timber wharves, you're just you're you're going to get those gaps. That's just the nature of 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 Doug fir. If what you want to do is provide an ADA accessible with the no gaps. Look at what they did on the east side, the east side of Santa Cruz Wharf, mm -hmm. when they widened that about five years ago. They went with concrete, but they did it in a way they've got like um, a textured concrete. They have a little uh, shell kind of embeds, a nautical type feel. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, I think that's a very effective way to provide, you know, a good usable surface that's, that meets accessibility requirements. Thank you. Dennis. In talking about concrete service, uh, this this wharf here has a lot more sway than Santa Cruz wharf, has. So, so there's a lot of movement up there. Is that is that is, can you design something that actually would not break up on us? Is that possible? We would we would have to detail. That's that's what we would have to do during the design process. Is look at that. But similarly, Santa Cruz, the, it's on their trestle. That's the same thing. That's their narrower part. Now they are either two lanes, and I think they're. 40 feet wide, I think you're 24 feet wide. Um, yeah, you're right, it is more flexible, so we, you, we would have to detail it and put in expansion joints and things to minimize you know, the, the cracking and the breakup. But yeah, I think that with between using polyester fibers and wire mesh, we could can you, certainly can, do that. Can you fill the, the metal pilings with concrete? The, the metal ones? Um, yeah, we could and drop down a steel cage. We could we could look at that and, and kind of. I believe that they are sand filled right now, um, but as far as whether that would be cost effective or not to do it, because you would have to you're gonna have to shore up the wharf deck while you do that, because you have to cut it out and drop in a steel cage. I think what we would be looking at is more of a fiberglass encasement system where they will also grout that the 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 inside, but. Basically, what they do is they put in a steel cage on the outside, fiberglass jacket around it that gets sealed, fill that full of grout or concrete, and that provides a, a pretty solid. Um, that's kind of that's the, sort of the current state of the yard of okay. uh, steel yeah, piles. Unfortunately, those are some of the newer piers that we put in the end of the end of the wharf, and also the landing, the, the piers that the metal piers that the landing are a problem now too, aren't they? Well, so, so, I mean, steel and salt water, you're going to get corrosion. I mean, those were put in in 1982, so they're now 35. Yeah. 34 years old, which the coating that was put on them at the time probably is not as robust as what we would use now. There's a lot of polyurea coatings that are, are quite good. Um, we'll look into whether it would be more effective to replace them or jacket them, but to pull them and shore the wharf up, that's, yeah, that's going to be problematic. I would think a fiberglass jacket would be okay. probably the most cost-effective. I have a question. You, um, I know this is for 
for wharf repair, but it seems like we really can't fix that wharf unless we fix that end building down there. I mean, the condition of the of the restaurants in pretty bad shape, and so it's just a matter of time that you know we're gonna we, we're gonna need to rebuild it or have a major remodel. Um, he's gonna probably in a position now within two years he can't use the upper deck, good or bad, and so. It, it may be it may be of interest to us to actually include restoration of that building or replacement of that building, and then if that's the case, we can put it in the right place. Is there a better place for it that, that offers more view? Is a public bathroom really in that in that need to go where it, where it is? So it gives us more it gives us more room to function and redesign if we if we start with a new building there. So just it's just certainly something we could look at. The um, you know we. Talked about building new public restrooms out there to give the restaurant a chance to open up and have a, a western view out of the out of the restaurant <coughs> itself. Mm -hmm. and I think that you know, get new restrooms and give the restaurant a chance. Certainly, um, I know there's a lot of dry rot on the <coughs> south side of the building right now that the crews are dealing with, and the and the upper deck's an ongoing problem. But um, <coughs> as we move forward with the with the major widening, if we go with that and Bathroom, we could certainly look at both buildings at, at that point and, and include some upgrades to those. Okay. Uh, Brad, in, in, um, barring the money situation when money comes, is there a way we can move this agenda forward? In other words, do we really have six to eight years to fix this wharf? We, I know you don't know that, but I'm saying is there a way <coughs> within your time scenario here that we can move this up to like a three-year program? Let me make sure I understand the question. I mean, are you asking could you widen the wharf? In less do, than do than, all the work within three years. Is that possible? It's possible. So I mean, one of the one of the things that, that will be a key will be the you know approval because you are widening, you're increasing your footprint over the water. So the Coastal Commission will will have to you know approve it and such. So I think that sometimes that permitting process can be. I think that's the biggest. The funding and the permitting are the biggest. So yeah, it's certainly possible if you can get permit approval and have the funds in place. Sure. Okay. And if I may interject also, I think that's why we separated the, the steel pile repair because we know we can go forward with that. Um, that's more of a maintenance permit that is uh, easier to get from the Coastal Commission. So I think that's why we kind of earmarked that one going just as quickly as we can, as funding is available, um, and while we're designing and, and permitting the, the major remodel work. Mayor? I'm going to follow work my way. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to come back to you. Steph, do you have any questions? John. Sure. I have a question. I'm obviously not an engineer in these regards, but for the new pilings, if we do get the money to widen, you know, to get that increased strength, um, can those piles be put in with cladding on them as you put them in place so that we don't have to clad them later? Oh, absolutely. That's Yes, for the new piles, that's how you would do it. You, that's how you do yeah, it? Yeah, you put the cladding on before you drive them. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, part of the engineering and design process, Will that include diving so we can ascertain the condition at the sand point, at the, the sand junction? It certainly can. Um, you know, we had that as an option in the um, in the, the recent inspection that we performed. Absolutely, you know, that, that, that can be done. Just in my experience, which includes I've dove um, the Santa Cruz Wharf, all 4,200 piles there, um, generally at low tide you can see about 90% of what, you're going to, that's where you generally see it is in that intertidal zone within the pile. But certainly doing um, a dive would be the prudent thing to do to see for that kind of a major rebuild. And, you know, it's it's a certain cost, probably, you know, I don't know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to do the dive. Thank you. Yeah. Just one quick question. You mentioned uh, we we're approaching 35 to 40 years on the pilings. With the clad pilings, what's, what's the life expectancy of those? Well, Okay. What we're talking about is fiberglass cladding on the timber piles. As far as the life of the cladding itself, I would say it's probably 100 years plus. But that's not to say that it wouldn't be damaged. I mean, the thing, the vulnerability that you have being on the open coast are the floating logs in the winter. And if you get a big, you know, uh, a large log that smacks into one of those, that cladding, it's going to help, but it, it might not save it. So... <sighs> The life of the cladding is 100 years, but it could get taken out the first winter if a log hits it. That's a fair assumption. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody from the public like to uh, come up and uh, weigh in on this? Welcome, Bob. Good evening. Good evening. Bob Edgren here. Um, 
as long in regards to the widening of the, the uh, wharf, wouldn't it make sense to put a bathroom at the foot of the wharf in addition to the new bathroom towards the uh, the restaurant area? Because that end of the beach or that end of the village, whatever you want to say, really lacks bathroom facilities, public bathroom facilities. I think it'd be really nice to have a facility there for not so much the uh, wharf people, but for beach people and people on the esplanade that need a place to go out, outside of Margaritaville or whatever. So. Great. That's all. Great suggestion. Anyone else like to comment on the wharf? Okay, we'll go ahead and close it and bring it back for some discussion. Stephanie. Well, I was going to bring up that bathroom issue also because um, one of the times that we talked about remodeling the wharf, we did talk about having a bathroom at the lower end because we, in those years, we had a lot of people that used Hooper's Beach. I don't I haven't seen that many people using Hooper's Beach as much as we they used to, but there were a lot of people down there, a lot of people over by the Venetians, a lot of people playing volleyball. We don't have the swings anymore, but we wanted a bathroom there, and then something small and modest, and and um, just a unisex bathroom. So I'd like us to look at that again too, see if there's any way we could incorporate that, so that people don't have to walk all the way down there <clears throat> just to use the bathroom. But if we could, you know, I don't I don't know if we want a portable. Yeah, those are kind there's, of ugly. There's but, one there now, and it's yeah, horrible. I know, us. I know. But we had talked about having something small that looked like a little cabin or a little. Um, something wooden and yeah, very yeah, just fit in and not stand out, and, and just something very modest that would work, that would work there for people. Dennis, um, you know, I I, I want to move to accept the report, but I'd like to add a couple things to the discussion. If one would be to look at if there's any method of moving the construction up in time, see if we can do this within this whole pro program within four years. I'm not sure we have that long a time to be able to wait f to do this work. Um, the second thing is is that I think we should look at the condition of the building at the end of the wharf. If we're gonna if we're gonna decide to redo it, um, we will have enough money within uh, the Measure F funds to actually cover cover that. Um, if it makes a more successful business and a better visiting area, maybe a visiting area could be included out there also. We talked about. Um, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary having a small touchy-feely thing out there in the wharf. And and then the, the relocation of the bathrooms would be determined not just by existing buildings, but it could be actually incorporated into to a new building out there. So I think we should look at the, the life, lifespan of the existing building, whether it's worth pursuing that at this time. Um, I think we should look at also um, there's real heavy use to it in the summertime now to the to the landings, and it used to be just boat use now. Now it's kayak, stand-up surfboards, and that whole industry is, is really taking over part of it. And so, a better setup at the landings would be nice to have if we're gonna. And we need we need new piling members to actually control that kind of movement of the docks there. So we should look at that at the same time. And that's my comment. Well, okay. I, do have, I do have one other one. Go ahead, sir. I won't tell you how I know this, but you go to YouTube and you, you type in Capitola Fishing. There's a fellow that goes out fishing, and he must have a GoPro, and he takes pictures of he and his two friends fishing and what they catch out there. So if you are totally bored, have nothing to do, check it out. It's actually kind of fun because he catches a bunch of fish. They're very excited, and it's really, it's really quite fun. They catch vermilion, and they catch rockfish. And uh, it's, it's really quite, quite a fun thing to do. It makes you want to go out there and rent a boat and go fishing and enjoy yourself. Good. You can catch fish out there. Yes, you can. Go ahead, Jack. Yeah. Um, so, Steve, you mentioned you're dealing with uh, rot, dry rot, I guess. And um, it was also mentioned that there's um, problems with the roof uh, at the restaurant. And do we have a general sense of how bad the building is? And I certainly agree with uh, Dennis. If we, if we don't, we need to really assess it. I mean, my general feeling is I know we're dealing with some the most southern edge of the wharf that's that exposed. There's some dry rot in the, in the siding itself. We're trying to evaluate that right now. Uh, Willie, the uh, manager of the restaurant, tore up the deck, uh, I think it was two seasons ago, mm -hmm. and took a good look at it. There's some drainage problems up there. He, he improved them as best as he could at that point, um, but he did replace the entire decking at that point. So... Um, you know, we'll, we'll, I'd be happy to assess it. I think it, it's, it's not eminent that it's falling down, but certainly there are buildings that are uh, 
in a harsh environment, and, and we, we were, con we're continuing, uh, continually working on them and trying to uh, maintain them. Like we're rebuilding the, uh, the that one southern exposure right now. The crews are doing that. We're looking at replacing the windows on that exposure too. Okay. Nothing imminent. Thanks. Nothing imminent. Michael. If, if we are going to be true to our intent with Measure F, we need to approach this not as a 10-year project, but as a three-year project. It has to be done as much as we can, as quickly as we can. I think if we commit any less than in $7 million of the life of Measure F, we're being disingenuous to the voting public. I think we need to be prepared as a council when Measure F passes, and I believe it will, for us to do a general obligation bond on the, on the um, revenue from Measure F to have all of these repairs done and more than your 10-year plan. I said up to $7 million including all the things the council has mentioned, and to commit to it immediately. And if we're going to go out on a plan and we're going to tell the public that we are going to use three-quarters of Measure F to completely rebuild the wharf, then we do it now. We do it now before we lose it. We do it now before we wait till year six to widen it and we lose it in the meantime. There's just too much risk here, and there's too much that needs to be done. The bathrooms at the head end of the – or the tail end of the wharf – very important. We need to get that that porta potty just gives a bad impression of our entire city. We need to make it a real bathroom at the entrance of the wharf. We need to rebuild the wharf house restaurant with the new bathrooms, widen the wharf, do the ADA accessibility, and and uh, replace or clad any pilings that are in danger. And we need to just plan on doing that the day after Measure F passes. And get a golf cart to take people out there. That can happen. Yeah. That's my job. Can I drive it? I'm going to look for Go ahead, Mr. City Manager. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Germany, I, I, I certainly appreciate the sentiment, and I, I just want to say that, you know, staff, if Measure F passes, is going to be committed to getting us from A to B as quickly as possible. Uh, and one of the things we would do is immediately go out to get a project manager because this is something that we don't do on an everyday basis. I, I would stress that this is going to be a challenging regulatory environment, and uh, I don't want to over-promise and under-deliver and tell you we can have it all done in three years because um, it it's going to take some time to get through state lands, get through the Coastal Commission, get through the sanctuary, uh, particularly when we're talking about widening. So I just want to understand. I want to temper I understand the enthusiasm, but I want to just make sure everyone's aware that that, that can be the goal, but uh, we need to be cognizant of the challenges. In addition, uh, I also want to stress that I think that this is going to be a great project for grant funding. So to the extent that we can keep Measure F funds available for other really important projects on our beach, like the Flume, like the Jetty, um, we can have the Coastal Commission um, help step in, Coastal Conservancy, excuse me, and help us with the wharf. I think we really should explore that. And I think particularly when we're talking about projects like restrooms and uh, resiliency, that those projects are, are great potential for grant funding. So, Agreed. And I'm just saying that, you know, I know that we can get the $11 million for the life of Measure F and turn it into 15 or $16 million. And I know we can do it with not a lot of effort. But I think if we don't begin immediately with a grand plan, we know how time passes. And it passes quickly. And every year we go without launching it is a year we've lost. So we need to be able to commit to step off immediately. Uh, does Moffitt and Nickel provide construction management, uh, project management uh, services? I haven't had that conversation with them, but I'm sure they can uh, I can't identify imagine, some staff available for us. Yes. I can't imagine anyone more qualified. Just yes. Good. So if, if I may mention really quickly, um, with the Measure F funds that are coming in, uh, Jamie mentioned it briefly. I recently reviewed a, a draft report of a sea level rise study and one of the, the key elements to uh, combating the sea level rise that they're projecting out is uh, reestablishment of our two jetties that we have. So I think that is a is a very important to protection for wave run up and tidal influences as we move forward into the generations ahead, but still something we should be looking at now and um, anything that doesn't go to the wharf, I think should, uh, those would be excellent projects for that. You, you have my unmitigated support. Uh, I'm just trying to get the most uh, vulnerable portion taken care of as soon as possible. But certainly we need to pay attention immediately to the jetties as well. They're just, they deteriorate in a slightly more gentle fashion. Yes. I concur with uh, Councilman Termini's uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, when we brought this up, when we brought up the idea of putting Measure F on the ballot, 
I think the intent was to, uh, you know, not only what we were going to do to the wharf, we were going to do it right and make it make it whole. We were, we were worried about losing the wharf. And uh, I agree with the comment that, uh, you know, the, the, the $11 million we may raise could easily turn into more based on grants. Um, I do want to save some of that revenue for the flume and for the bulkhead and for the jetties and for other things. This was called the Ocean Protection Fund, and it primarily the focus was the wharf. Um, I think when we put this out to the public, the intent was is that we were going to try, and, and I know this is optimistic, but it was uh, the timeline was we were going to try to have this ready to go out to bid in a couple of years. And I realize that the, the Coastal Commission is going to be one of the major hurdles we're going to have to overcome. The other important part of this process is, is you know, I, I totally support, you know, redoing the restaurant if that's what it needs. Rather than going out there and doing more Band-Aids, I think the intent was to, you know, rebuild it. And my main concern is that it goes out to the public. There's public input because I'm concerned about what it's going to look like from this vantage point. I mean, we always want to know that the wharf looks like what it seems to look like. My impression is that is the the – the, uh, the panhandle of the wharf, even though it's going to be twice as wide, which is what I'm hoping for, so it has stability, from this view, I still want it to look the same. And I think a lot of people are concerned about what it looks like and what those buildings looks like. So I'm hoping there's going to be an extensive public process for input about bathrooms on the front, bathrooms on the restaurants. I think bathrooms on both ends are long overdue. Um, and like I said, the primary concern is that we want it to be stable. Uh, we want to move through the process. I think that, you know, I feel real good about the measure passing, having sufficient funds. And I, I carry the sentiment that we all want this to start as soon as possible. And I believe the city embraces that. And the project manager is a great idea. So that's uh, – with that, you have one more comment? Go ahead, John. Um, so in regards to the time to get approvals and such, um, I think in part of our conversations we've talked about the fact that this is going to basically ensure access. And has that been part of a conversation with the Coastal Commission that, you know, this is – we're not just trying to keep it alive. We're also, you know, making sure access is always going to be there. You know, we've had just very preliminary conversations with the Coastal Commission about potential widening, and we haven't gotten into any detailed discussion with them. Certainly. That will be our push. That's what Santa Cruz Wharf did when they're, they're doing a widening project, and it's all about public access and all that. So, so that's part of your argument. That, is, that will be definitely part of our arguments. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so our, oh, go ahead. Potential motion. but Well, I, I was just going to ask, are we just to accept this? Uh, do you need direction from us? Uh, I think you've given action? us enough directions. It's just to accept the report and give us I, our marching orders. I'd like to give you more direction. Oh, go. <laughs> and I would move upon passage of Measure F that we have Public Works bring us uh, bring us back a potential project manager and a three-year timeline and budget for a complete overhaul of our wharf, including the suggestions that have been mentioned by council members tonight. There a second? Second. Second. Any additional comment from oh, Stephanie? I would like to to have, to to have somebody dive it, if possible, just to make sure there's not any garbage down that, there or well, any junk down there. That should Probably, be included we, with the Yeah, I mean, we, we yeah. talked about it before. Willie didn't seem to think that there was anything down there. I know Santa Cruz has had divers go down there and clean up because they had chairs and tables. And, but there <laughs> might not be anything. But just while we're doing all this, I'd love to have somebody go down there safely and just make sure that there's not stuff that we should be removing that uh, doesn't belong there. Well, the kind of money that was mentioned for diving, yeah. I, I can't imagine not doing that as part of the entire We, we can do that process. immediately. I think the diving was included in our discussion, and that's part of this recommendation. M Monterey has a, has a used to have a, a cleanup every year at one of their wharfs because people would actually drive out to the end and throw stuff off, and they would find all kinds of stuff. And, and so I'm hoping we won't, we won't find anything here, but it's good to check. Okay, I'll just open up for uh, comments on the wharf. Come on up. Uh, hi. Craig Sala. I live on 49th Avenue. I go to the wharf house every morning have coffee, uh, walk down there, and I know all the people there. I know the owners of the businesses and all that. Somehow, through this conversation in my mind, uh, with the ADA requirements and all these things that these people go through, they're just like functioning, working, local people, and they have issues uh, with all that. And I, in my mind, I think you're bypassing uh, some of those concerns. I understand what your concerns are about widening the wharf, uh, the engineering, all that. 
and I only have three words, is where's the money? Uh, Proposition F, is that really going to the wharf, or is it going to, you know, uh, some other thing in the city coffers that they need to get done, like I think you guys are talking about the uh, the drains, the storm drains and stuff like that. I don't know much about that. But I just needed to say this on behalf of uh, Frank Ely and uh, Willie, the owner of the Wharf House, because what you're doing here to me is putting uh, a heavy burden, uh, burden on uh, a small businessman. Uh, and so I'm asking you as a city council, to think in terms of uh, when you make these decisions, uh, how it's going to affect these people. Um, I liked uh, Mr. Termini. Is it? I, you know, I liked his observations. And uh, every once in a while, I guess we need to go back and think about uh, the, the regular people in Capitola and how it affects them. And that's all I have to say about the war. I'm going I'm to respond to you if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah, um, go ahead, Dennis. Both Willie and Frank have been attuned both huh? Willie and Frank have been attuned to what we're doing out there, and, and Willie obviously is a big supporter of us. He knows his building's got its life. The problem is, if we get a storm in the condition we have now, they won't have a business out there. Yeah, no, I That's understand. Why we're that. doing that. You know, it's public access, and um, we're protective of those businesses out there. Yeah, I, you know, I know we all have to grow, and we have to do what we have to do. Uh, my concerns is about, you know, how far do we grow? And I, I came here to talk about the parklets. But we're going to get to that. It's okay. like, yeah. yeah, and we'll, it's we'll like, you know, how far do you grow and, uh, you know, where do you need to stop and, and where do you need to call capital a village rather than a city? I mean, that, these are real important okay. areas. We're, Craig, we're just going to focus on the war right now. I do want to address your concerns. Yeah, okay. You, well, you came up. No, I'm going to respond. You were concerned about the money, and I want you to know that the reason we put this, this council unanimously voted to put Measure F on the ballot was to raise the money because – we didn't want to lose the wharf. We didn't want to have some accident, some big storm, take the wharf out. And so this commitment from this council, and just so you know that, this money that's being raised is, is to rebuild that wharf. In addition to that, it's not going into the storm drains, just so you're clear. that We're talking about reinforcing the jetties. Yes. We're talking about reinforcing the bulkhead on Soquel Creek. We're talking yeah. about we may have to rebuild the flume that controls the flow. This is all an ocean attacking the city of Capitola fund. Yes. And, and with the passage of Measure F, what we're trying to say today is this council is committed to preserving what we have there and making it better and stronger so we can know that it's always going to be there. Okay, so I have three words for you. Follow the money. Okay. If that, I mean, if that's where it goes, I'm fine with that. Good. But follow the money. I've seen it change hands a lot. But thank you. I we, appreciate it. We know you'll be following it for us, Craig. I will. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Come on up, Bob. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, a little follow-up on the previous comment. Uh, Willie did mention a, a concern about the money being misdirected towards, like, the police department, which I know is included in Measure F. So it is something that needs, I think, a little attention. Uh, besides that, I think it would really be helpful to have a computer graphic of the wharf as maybe it would look like from eight different angles. And I don't know if you have that capability, but... I think that would be really helpful to people to let them know what it's going to look like, you know. Or And it can always be changed. You could add another building, whatever, and expand the wharf. Uh, but I think that would be really helpful. Looking at a photo of the wharf as it is now really doesn't do much. Um, so that's all. Just um, I'll comment on that, too. You did, what we're trying to do, what this process is about, what, 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 what my understanding was is we don't know what it's going to look like. And what, what, I'm encur what I'm encouraging, Bob, is this is going to go out for a public process so the people of Capitola will tell us what they want it to look like. Well, the people of Capitola have a hard time imagining it unless they see a photograph. Well, and that's where we would have some renderings drawn up, and we could do that. We could, we could speculate on what give possible options to we could do this. I guarantee if we're going to have a plan drawn up about the widening of the wharf, we will drop some plans. I guess, so I guess what I'm at. trying to say at this point in time, since we already have um, more or less bids or whatever uh, um, estimates on the repair and everything, we're talking about expanding the panhandle of the war for so many feet. I think this is the time to have the computerized uh, graphics of it. So people could stand back and say, oh, 
it's either good or it's not good or I like it or I don't like it, rather than a few months down the road, you know, it, I think this is the time to have a graphic of what it's going to look like. Thank, thank you, Bob. Appreciate thank those you. comments. And if, if I can elaborate on my on my um, motion, and my apologies if it wasn't clear, it was not to intensify the use of the wharf. It was not to build new buildings. It was not to put more businesses out there. It was to make sure Willie and Frank were still there after the next storm. As far as computer graphics, the wharf's going to look like the wharf looks now, but stronger and slightly wider at the back end. So it's much ado about nothing, and I'd like to call the question. Okay, we're going to, uh, we have a motion on the floor, and we had a second. Dennis, you second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Council. Okay, our next item is a consideration of a village parklet pilot program. Mr. Grinnell. Larry said don't do that. Oh, you're... Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Apologies for the delay. So parklets, uh, we initially discussed parklets when we did our stakeholder, stakeholder outreach during the zoning code update. We did receive some comments and, uh, from folks that expressed a desire to consider adding parklets in the village. Um, we had further discussions with both the Planning Commission and City Council during the zoning code update public hearings. The Planning Commission ultimately uh, recommended that we remove provisions to allow parklets in the village and subsequently the City Council concurred with that direction but directed staff to come back and present a parklet pilot program for their consideration. So parklets are sidewalk extensions which typically occupy one or more street parking spaces. Uh, they can be used for outdoor dining areas or some are just simply passive seating areas where folks can relax and socialize. Uh, they're often associated with uh, seating, landscaping, uh, sun umbrellas, bike parking, public art, and other features. Uh, pictures here are of the parklet that recently opened, I think this past year, in Santa Cruz. So there are a number of issues for the council to consider when they weigh whether or not they want to launch a parklet pilot program, uh, principally the location of where they could be allowed in the village, how many you would want to allow, um, the cost that we would charge uh, an applicant uh, to process permits, and to build a parklet, uh, how long the pilot program should be allowed for, various design and operational considerations, and then a couple of coastal issues that I'll bring to your attention near the end of the presentation. So in terms of the location and number of parklets, um, to have a parklet, it's got to have on-street parking, and I think for Capitola Village, where there's uh, also a restaurant fronting business. So those streets would be limited to Capitola Avenue, the Esplanade, Monterey Avenue and San Jose Avenue. Uh, the draft policy that was included in your staff report uh, is for a two-year pilot program and would limit the options to Monterey Avenue and San Jose Avenue between the Esplanade and Capitola Avenue. Um, and it also has a maximum of two parklets, each occupying up to two parking spaces. Uh, in drafting the policy, staff selected uh, San Jose Avenue and Monterey only because based on past discussions we've had with both the Planning Commission and Council, there seemed to be um, some concern about adding it to the Esplanade due to congestion and the high demand for parking there. And Capitola Avenue is really limited opportunities between uh, Stockton and the Trestle. There's three businesses that could potentially have a parklet, but they didn't seem to be great fits, so that was the reasoning behind Monterey and San Jose Avenue. Cost is another uh, big consideration for the council to, to think about. Um, of course, applicants would be responsible for all the construction, maintenance, and removal costs associated with a parklet. Uh, however, there are other potential costs, including permitting, uh, security for, remo for removal, lost parking meter revenue, 
and in-lieu parking fees that the council could consider as part of a pilot program. Uh, one point that we would make, though, is given the limited term of a pilot program, whether it be one, two, or even three years, uh, full cost recovery for all these uh, costs could deter participation if it makes it so that a parklet would not pencil out for a business. So as shown in the table here, the estimate that we came up with was for an application cost just to get it through a permitting process, pay securities, um, would range somewhere in the neighborhood of $5,700 to $6,000. Then annual costs could range from you know, $4,500 $4, and upwards, depending on how we uh, scaled those parking costs. There are several design and operational issues uh, that we looked at when drafting the policy. Uh, we looked at a number of guideline documents that other cities have used uh, that have parklet programs. Um, parklets in Capitola would require the Planning Commission issue a design permit and they would require a coastal development permit. Uh, some of the design standards that we put into the administrative policy would require buffers between parklets and the adjoining parking spaces. Uh, the any parklets would have to comply with ADA and stormwater regulations, that they may not interfere with any utilities, manholes, or storm drains, and that they have solid exterior edges and landscaping to both protect and soften the visual effect uh, from the street. So in terms of buffers, a number of cities that have adopted parklet design programs suggest a four-foot buffer for parallel parking spaces and a three-foot buffer for diagonal and perpendicular parking spaces. Those areas are often occupied by landscaping, solid walls, bike parking, or other amenities. Uh, we've also included a requirement that soft hit, soft hit posts and wheel stops be placed at the adjoining parking spot to help prevent cars from rolling in and contacting the parklet. Exterior edges and landscaping, again, this is best, uh, based on best practices used by other cities. Uh, exterior edges would be a minimum of 30 inches tall or 42 inches tall if the establishment served alcohol in the parklet. There would also be a requirement for landscaping consisting generally of small bushes, hanging plants, potted plants, and flowers. In terms of operation, we limited the hours from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's something you could certainly look at and, and restrict or expand. Uh, we included no lighting, signs, or advertising to be allowed in a parklet. Uh, as drafted, we allowed alcohol to be served there. That would require a license from the California Alcohol and Beverage Control Department. And that unattached furnishings must be removed daily from the parklet uh, by the operator. And again, applicants would be responsible at the end of the term for removing the parklet at their own expense, and we would suggest the security to ensure that that happens. We did discuss this a little bit with the Coastal Commission. Uh, they confirmed that any parklet would require an appealable coastal development permit. They also expressed concerns with the loss of public parking spaces and questioned whether or not Capitol had any need for additional public seating or dining space in the village. Uh, they did comment if parklets were to be installed and if they were able to support it, that they would prefer them to be open to the public at any time and not for the exclusive use of restaurants. Uh, ultimately, though, Coastal Commission staff was not prepared to give us an indication of whether or not they would support or oppose a parklet program. So that kind of concludes my presentation. This slide just uh, gives you an example of some of the uh, creative designs, I guess, that have been used in parklets in different agencies and cities. Not that these would necessarily work in Capitola, but just to demonstrate that there's a lot of creative, kind of neat, funky things that you can do with them if there was a desire to move forward. And so with that, I will conclude my presentation and answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Dennis? Yes, um, thank you. Um, in our history, um, Britannia Arms asked you his lease restaurant one time. The city offered a lease to him, and he expanded um, his restaurant out the backside into state into city parkland. Do you, do you have any idea what the lease is, agreement is on that? Yeah, so that is uh, we get $350 a month from Britannia, and the square footage area is a little bit under 300 square feet. About the size of a parklet, then, about 300 square feet? Okay. Thereabouts. Okay. Uh, Zelda's. Uh, Zelda's at one time was just a restaurant and through the years, and I think it was prior to the Coastal Commission, they purchased the deck there, and we, we offered them 
they got a permit to actually expand as is the same as it would be a parklet. They expanded out into beach areas, of that the old deck. It actually was the merry-go-round deck, and they purchased that and they got permits to do that. And they also expanded that deck without providing any additional parking to the village. That was just added, and it doubled the size of their restaurant. So we have a history of, of actually taking in the same concept of allowing allowing parklets within our community. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the history on on uh, on the uh, uh, Paradise Beach Grill, but there was one time a greenhouse out on the back part where that deck is, and that was actually built onto the onto the restaurant and added onto as a greenhouse. And then they turned it and they opened took the greenhouse off of it. So it, it's not unprecedented to offer public space or, or space outside of a restaurant into into um, public eating areas. And, and we haven't been strict at all in our demands for parking in replacement of that. So this is really not a, a new concept. It's a new concept in that we're, we're trading off parking spaces for, um, for, for private parkland. Um, what, what kind of revenue do we, do we see per meter in, a, in, in the village? What's the average revenue? Uh, last year we took in approximately $3,200 per meter in the village over the course of the year. Um, sorry. Um, the it, it, in ownership, the, the village the village parking area is really all public area. Is that correct? It doesn't. There's there's no there's no privately owned it. There's oh. no besides a couple of businesses. There's no no businesses that really provide parking. It's all city owned. All the street parking is public and maintain and they maintain. It, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, Pacific Cove is that who pays for that and who maintains that? Uh, city pay, pays for it and maintains it. So there's no private contribution or money collected from any business or anybody else to provide for that. The city right. takes it takes up that. So, in essence, all of the parking in the village really is city land and city ownership to do to it as they choose. And this is this is a project. It appears to me that the city does have a choice if they they choose to to use this this space, whether it's parking or whatever it is, they can use it for improving economic vitality of a certain area. It, has there been any discussion about how, how you get people within the community to even walk down San Jose Avenue? Besides the front of the mercantile right now, there's no sight line to the major thoroughfare as far as it being a business area. There's a few businesses along there. And there's more towards when you get to Capitol Avenue. But I don't, I don't see that there's any, there, there's no exposed type of uh, draw for for economic vitality along that street, there, um, would you would you think, Rich, that that there would be some help if you had a sight line where you saw something going on down that street that to improve the the pedestrian traffic to come down in that area? You know, it's it's hard to definitively say. I mean, it's a possibility, sure. Okay. What in in public works department? Maybe Steve can answer this. What percentage? Um, of public works labor is in the village proper itself. Just in our routine maintenance, uh, we spend about $30,000 a year, which is about 3% of our personnel budget. Uh, just that's the daily cleaning and uh, trash removal uh, in the village. Okay. Just 3% of the whole, the whole public. Yeah, and we do other projects in the village. We do other projects throughout the rest of the city, but just yeah. the forces that we dedicate to uh, cleaning the village every morning is about 3%. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's my question. Did your questions? Okay, Stephanie, any questions? John, questions? Um, Rich, has anyone come to you and expressed any interest in parklets? You know, people have uh, generally expressed an interest in them, but I have not been approached by any business owners who have had an interest in building or operating one. We have some people in the audience. In, where? In the audience. That will, okay. We okay. may get to that. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, as far as lights, I was just wondering what was the reason for no lights? You know, it just seemed that, uh, you know, based on my experience here, people uh, don't, encourage lighting, signage, kind of advertising in the village unnecessarily. Um, certainly it's a policy call if the council wanted to allow them with lighting, that you know, it's something we could easily do. So if, um, supposing there was one out in front of Caruso's, 
would um, no lights include no candles or, you know, like it would be pretty dark I, out there for dinner maybe? I wouldn't interpret a candle to be prohibited under a no lighting condition. Okay. I think you could have candles. Michael, any questions? Okay. Anybody from the public like to come and weigh in on proposed parklets? Come on up to the... My name is Mackenzie Fulmer. I just bought Cava Capitola down in the village next to Caruso's. Um, we have definitely expressed an interest in building a parklet, which we, we would accrue all the expenses for that. We need visibility down San Jose Avenue. There's nothing there. We don't need to have flashing lights that say we're open, but we just need to have something to attract, attract businesses to come down. For the pilot program, it's not permanent. We don't need to build a structure that would be permanent. It would be easily removable. Of course, we would accrue all the costs. Um, we have investors that could do that, and it wouldn't be a big deal for us. I've talked to many businesses inside the mercantile, which would be interested, like Left Coast Sausage, um, BFF, the taffy store of Kathy there, um, and Sandy Paws, Carla Hootlandsa, were all interested in helping us, to, uh, encouraging us to build this parklet to increase visibility for the San Jose Avenue project. Um, so there's been several projects down, well, there's been two projects down in, in Santa Cruz that have been very successful. One, Hula's was so successful that Lupelo's next door decided to build the parklet as well. It's not, it's not a, it's a parallel parking project parallel parking project, which is a little different than ours, but it's been so successful that both businesses have been very happy with the outcome of that. Um, so in response to some of the um, things that the um, Gary Wetzel has brought up from uh, the owner of uh, Paradise, there's responses that I have for each one of his questions, but in essence, you know, it's San Jose Avenue needs some visibility and we're there, and we're happy to do that. We're happy to accrue the costs. We're happy to accrue the costs of the revenue of those parking spots. We'd like to discuss more um, the viability of that. We are open to all of that. It would just really help these businesses in the mercantile to grow and to be economically successful. It's hard being down that street. It really is, and we hope that you guys would take that into consideration and help us out in that visibility. We have several people here. Melissa from Cruces also is very on board with this situation, and we hope that you guys consider that, and, and we'd love to do, discuss that further. I, I just have a quick question. Sure. Do you, are you interested in it to increase your business? Because it seems like your business is doing really well. We are interested in having some outside visibility. It's hard because people don't know where we're at. When we say San Jose Avenue, People, my first question is, where is that? But aren't you pretty busy? Is that really a problem for your business? It, it is. seems like seems Absolutely. like you're doing you're doing it well. It is a problem. Absolutely. Okay. Not having the outside seating is a problem. So you're quiet a lot. Your business is slow a lot, and you think this would really help your business? Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. So you mentioned other businesses like in mercantile yes. and stuff. So would you consider this to be a shared one? Like you would uh, get together with some of the other businesses there I've and talked with every business that's in there and they have all agreed that this would be a great thing for the mercantile in general as well as us okay it's not just it's not just us that we're here for it's for everybody in the mercantile okay the mercantile is taking a hit and we need to increase the business that comes down there thank you thank you for your, your comments You just, if, if you want to come and speak, you just have to get in a line up here. That, excuse me a second, Susan. Hold on. If you want to speak, I encourage you to stand up and get in line, and that way you'll be guaranteed or you can wait. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Uh, I'm here tonight representing the Planning Commission, and for that reason, I'm actually going to read my statement so I stay on track and do what I was directed to do. Uh, the City Council is well aware that the Planning Commission has devoted a great deal of time and energy to thoughtfully revising the City's current zoning regulations. 
As part of our review, the Commission discussed the idea of having parklets in Capitola Village. After evaluating other programs such as San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Berkeley, uh, the Planning Commission unanimously felt that parklets are not a good idea for Capitola Village. Reasons for thinking that parklets are not a good idea for the village include the Commission's concern that taking four public parking places out of the village parking supply and providing them to one or two privately owned restaurants was unfair to the other restaurants, businesses, and residents who share this pool of public parking. If the Council wants to talk about eliminating parking places or reducing the number of cars in the village, that discussion should be done in an overall comprehensive parking study that would involve all the people who are currently sharing this parking supply. The Planning Commission would be happy to work with the Council on this type of future planning project. The Planning Commission also felt that Capitola Village is not a dense, concrete, urban environment such as San Francisco, Los Angeles, or even Berkeley. Capitola Village is unique, and just because something works in other places doesn't automatically mean it's a good idea for the village. Capitola Village already has a large area devoted to public, public seating and public open space along the beach as well as on the beach itself. In addition, the Planning Commission has worked hard to make certain the new zoning ordinance includes provisions that allow some of the smaller restaurants in the village to expand. The Planning Commission's approach to allowing for some expansion does not incorporate the use of parklets. The Planning Commission's approach was to reduce the parking requirements for village res restaurants and allow for internal expansion of existing restaurants without requiring additional parking. Let's take Caruso's, which is currently a 674 square foot restaurant as an example. They would be able to occupy an additional 240 square feet when the new zoning ordinance is adopted because the parking requirements for Caruso would go from 10 spaces in the current zoning ordinance to 6 spaces in the draft ordinance. That's a 24% increase in their existing square footage. In addition, there's another provision that allows for another 20% increase without providing additional parking. Caruso's has the potential of increasing the size of its restaurant by 42% and would not have to provide any additional parking. The Planning Commission felt this was a much better approach to creating opportunities for small restaurants to expand within their existing businesses. The Planning Commission would recommend that the City Council not go forward with the proposed temporary trial parklet program, but instead give the new zoning ordinance a chance to work. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you have. Thanks for that report from the Planning Commission, Susan. I appreciate that. <laughs> Susan is a fan. I guess. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Jill Castagnola Anderson. I am the manager of St. John's Helpful Shop, as well as my family owns property in Capitola Village. The property my family owns is located at 208 Monterey, so we rent out the bottom half of our property to Avalon Visions. We rent out the top half, um, and uh, we rent it out through Beach House Rentals. So my concern that's brought me here tonight is concerning the parklets, not only because it will impact the valuable parking spaces that we have for customers as well as volunteers. We currently have about 25 volunteers with St. John's Supple Shop. We're in our 63rd year. We uh, currently purchased two spots in the privately owned parking spots um, across the street from St. John's Huffle Shop owned by Swinson's. And we pay approximately $600 annually for those spots for a four month period. As well as we also purchase a parking spot from the city for $50 a month just for the overflow. Um, the parklets, even though I do support all of our merchants down in the Capitola Village, I do support um, individuals with uh, Mercantile. BFF Boutique is one of our uh, networking friends. I feel that it will impact the valuable space that we already have. 
as a landowner in the village, we are not allowed to purchase as a resident as a residential um, property owner any additional parking permits because the city says that we have a certain amount of bedrooms in our place and we have parking behind it. So um, that was something that has changed in the last couple of years. So with the shrinking size of the available parking spaces in the village, <coughs> I strongly encourage you to look at everything that it affects. And even though, like I said, I do support the individuals that are uh, wanting this, I feel that we have to look at what is best for the village as a whole. Thank Great, you. thank you for those comments. Hi, Pam. Good evening, Pam Greninger. Um, I've lived in Capitola for about almost 38 years. I love the village. It's a great place. And I have a number of relatives and friends that actually own property and live in the village. And we've had discussions about this potential parklet uh, proposal. And their concerns are with parking. As you know, especially on summer days, um, it's hard to find a place, and they will drive around and around the village uh, trying to find a parking place. And I believe Monterey and uh, San Jose are both places where they can actually park because there's a number of areas that are not um, – that residents can't park in. So I think we really need to um, think about um, what we're doing and whether it's really a good fit for our community. Um, I mean, it sounds good. It looks good in some communities, but I don't know if it's, it's the best thing. But there's a lot of other things to consider besides, you know, uh, the availability of parklets and trying it out. We need to think about the residents who actually live here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Nels. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Council. My name is Nels Westman. I sent a lengthy email, and I hope you had a chance to read it. So no need to go into that level of detail tonight. I just want to reiterate that I think converting village parking spaces to parklets for additional space for a couple of restaurants is plain and simply a terrible idea and does not deserve any sort of trial. It is bad management of what limited parking space we have in the village. It takes parking away from village residents and their overnight parking needs, retail merchants, locals and visitors in order to create more table space for a couple of village residents. It's the most selfish thing I've ever heard of. These parking spaces will be lost 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in order that a few diners and wine drinkers can sit in the middle of the street during nice summer weekends uh, and enjoy their cocktails. The costs are high, likely, in my opinion, sixty to seventy thousand dollars, based on the um, newspaper uh, coverage that I've seen from cities like Berkeley and Los Angeles. This is the kind of budget that they say you need to plan for. And if you need to include all the permitting costs, the construction and installation costs, reimbursing the city for the lost meter revenue, maintaining the spaces, repairing the damage, removing the graffiti, all of it. And there is no way that a little restaurant like Caruso's can possibly afford this. And quite frankly, I'm flabbergasted that even Cabo says they have this kind of money to drop to attract people to walk down the street. But you should not, absolutely not, put the burden of a trial program on the backs of the city taxpayers by waiving all or most of these costs. Parklets should be 100% the financial responsibility of whatever business benefits from them. This parklet proposal is just another example of these attempts to intensify and turn the village into a, a giant food court with more congestion and more parking demands while simultaneously reducing the parking supply and eroding city revenues. The community has clearly indicated that this is not what they want to see happen in the village. And there is no reason to have a trial program for a bad idea. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Excuse me. There's no outbursts allowed, okay? We respect everybody's opinion to speak. 
When you speak, nobody interrupts you, and I expect that to go the same way. So please refrain from outbursts. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Lance Eppard. I'm one of the property management people that work for the mercantile. You know, the perspective that we, I we just heard was very well spoken. However, it didn't take into consideration any of the costs, expenses that were exposed during the, the discussion before. Um, the total costs were going to be incurred by the by the individuals that have those restaurants. The fact of the matter is, is that there are, I run two parking lots in, in the village. People don't know that there's parking available here that are run by the, by the city. I'm telling people every day, go park up there. It's cheaper than what we're offering for you. And the fact that there's going to be maybe two, maybe four spots that are, that are left unavailable for the general population, when people don't even know there's parking available there. They run in circles. Yes, they do, because they're not aware. I, and a private business is telling people, don't park in my parking lot. Go up there. It's cheaper because these people are suffering to try to find a place to come, sit down, and spend money in the village. Now, as far as the, the dynamic goes for the mercantile, there's been people in this room that have made comments about it that it being a blighted area and wanted the ownership to do something different than what is being done and not permitted them to do things they frankly should not do. The reality of it is is that we're not talking about tax revenue. We're not talking about expenditures because obviously only 3% of the, the public works on a daily basis being spent in the, in the mercantile or in, in the village. But the reality is is that that environment was once a thriving area. And because of the shift in the dynamics in the, in the village and the traffic flow shift, it's changed what's been able to happen in that environment. It's not going to be ever going to be the capital of Mall, what it could have been and should be as far as tax revenue, but the base of it could be better. And it could be a place where people can begin to, if, if only incubate businesses that go elsewhere, and we've seen that happen. My, my point is, is that those few spaces, to allow that environment right there to, to come back, um, I, I believe would be a great boon to that environment. And I, I have to say, to be honest, it's, it's, I have a couple of dogs in the fight. But I also, I've, I've failed in a business in the village because of lack of parking. It's, it's not a lack of parking as a result of what the city does. It's a lack of foresight in the business owners placing a business in a place where they know the parking is not there. And they have to compensate for that. This environment has a rich parking environment that you've provided. We need to drive people there and let them walk a little bit and let them come into the village and spend the money that we all need them to spend. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. Good afternoon, my name is Melissa and I am the owner of Caruso's Tuscan Cuisine and I feel that this pilot program would be a good thing for us. I'm not being selfish, I work really hard every day there trying to bring people in to a one street where there's no visibility. Having this is not only going to help me, but it's also going to help Gava. Gava and us, we help each other. When it's dead down there, what do we do? We come up with ideas to help each other. Not only is it going to help her, it's going to help myself, but it's also going to help everybody in the Mercantile Mall. In the Mercantile Mall, we're not just vendors, people that sell things, people that are nobody knows. I mean, people, I have been down here for two years, and every person that walks into my restaurant has become more than just a guest. They've become more like family, very good friends. And having this, I mean, I've had guests that tell me, why don't you guys expand, put space out there? We would love to sit out there. For me, I think it would be a good idea. No, I'm not being selfish. I'm a hardworking woman. And I think that it would only not only benefit us, but it's going to benefit everybody in the mall. Because why? I'm not going to just be selfish and just keep it to myself. I'm going to share it with everybody in the mercantile mall. And if I have a guest that wants to sit outside, why not? I mean... Parking is already, I mean, they make a lot of money off of it. It's not saying that we're going to get it for free. We're going to pay for it. And I feel that 
it would be, I mean, it's a, it's a pilot program. It's just going to be a trial to see how it works. If it works, it will be great for all of us. If it doesn't work, we can go on. Thank you for your comments. Hi, Bob. Hi, how's everybody doing? Okay, a couple things. Um, on the cost breakdown that was shown earlier, I didn't see anything in there that told me how the uh, existing parking spaces we have would be uh, compensated or equalized. I, I know when you start adding parking, parklets or whatever, intensification, that removes us, removes par our parking space bank, okay? Uh, I think there's some should be, if you're even going in that direction, which I don't agree, uh, some kind of monetary fixation on on a parklet as it relates to the Pacific Grove lower uh, 56 spaces. Uh, I am kind of uh, interesting listening to uh, the mercantile. I always kind of wondered how they could run two businesses, a mall and a paid parking lot. It's kind of like 41st Avenue charging their patrons to park out in the parking lot. Now, what I also heard tonight was Capitol is very open to uh, expanding things like this. Uh, brought up the uh, Zelda's deck and uh, Britannia. Let me say this. In 1974, I had the Soup Galley restaurant and the building, the business and the building in escrow, which included the deck, okay? The, f the owner at that time told me, you're going to have a hell of a time with the city. They won't let me do anything with the deck, nor would they let any, any, the owner prior to that do anything with the deck, and he, he went uh, bankrupt. So I have to say this. When, when I had it in escrow, I went to the city, I talked to them. What was the answer? No. No. There's no parking. Sorry. Bye. I walked away from that deal. Thereafter, uh, John Ely was somehow able to do whatever he pulled, pull whatever he did, and he got the deal. But that hurt me. You know, it, it was a setback for me. Now, fast forward to 1990, I bought the old Max Patio building, okay, which is now the Britannia Arms. That was also a trial. Um, went to the city and knew that area in front of the building was city property, and I wanted to lease at least a part of it, just like, um, I guess, uh, I don't know who, who got that done, but uh, again, what was the answer? No, sorry, you don't have the parking. We don't have the parking. I would have loved to have that little patio. If I had that little patio, guess what? Probably, would, my, probably my tenants would still be there. Probably I would still own the building. But I took a big, big hit. I took a big hit on that. Um, so what I'm saying is, just to uh, make that record straight, is there has been a record of this city saying no, just plain no, okay? And they, you know, it's, it's, that's the reality of it, okay? That's, that's what my experience has been. Maybe wrong time, wrong place, wrong, I don't know what. But I've experienced a lot of no's in this town, okay? Another one I just met with uh, Minna Hotel the other day who used to own the Capitola Hotel. Oh, my gosh, how many no's did she face? Just asking for little things, that goofy little lot on the side. No, no, no. Now, okay. Bob, so, go ahead and, and start wrapping up, okay? Yeah. So just to set the record straight, the city does have a long record of just saying no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. My name is Shay, and I'm opening a shop in the in the Mercantile as well, called Off the Block. And uh, so I know some of my neighbors here. And um, you know, when they ex first expressed interest in um, creating the parklets, I thought it was a great idea. Um, when I first uh, checked out the shop that I'm going to be moving into, um, the address is on San Jose Avenue, so that's the first place I saw. And honestly, driving down there, I was a little bit worried. I was like, okay, a little less, a lot less foot traffic, a lot less traffic in general down there. And, um, you know, luckily I'm on the Esplanade side, you know, so like that doesn't affect me as much, but I definitely see where they're coming from, getting some more foot traffic. I think you asked earlier, the gentleman here, if that, um, you know, if you see that down there, is it more likely to, I guess, bring foot traffic down there or to catch your eye? And I think that's a definite yes. If, if, if it's myself and I'm walking down there and I see some people eating, just commotion in general, I'm definitely more apt to go down there, whereas now, you know, it's a little bit dead, so it doesn't catch my attention. So, um, and as far as the parking situation, I definitely um, agree with, I think Lance left, but, um, you know, the Capitola Village Park and the parking right up here, I feel like that's not utilized as much. I mean, when I first moved down here checking out businesses and stuff, I was doing my little circles down in the village and finally caught on to that. So, 
Um, maybe if there's a way to use, utilize that more, so maybe people spend more time in the village, maybe their car's a little further away, so they spend more money and time at the village. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, and, um, and then lastly, I'll just say, since they're, they'd be incurring all the costs for this program, um, you know, I'd just like to reiterate, I don't think it's necessarily a tax burden on the city if they're going to be fronting, if they're willing to front that, them and their investors. So um, hopefully we take that all into account and, um, you know, we'll make the best decision for Capitola Village as a whole, but I would like to see the parklets. Hey, I believe I have a question. Sure. Uh, explain what off the block is. Uh, it's uh, well, it might take a while, but it's snow cream, basically shaving ice cream and boba teas like bubble milk tea, popsicles, mud cakes, bunch of fun, delicious stuff. Yeah, got it. Thank yeah. you. So, if you guys get the park, let's sit no, okay. Thank, Thank you, guys. Hi, Craig. Back for the real thing. Okay, good. Um, number one is how many of you been to Europe? Anybody? Okay. Let me in once. I just got back. And uh, I see people walking, I see cobblestone streets, I see outside dining, I see people having, I was in Vienna and I had a cup of coffee and got to watch people go by and I thought, wow, that would be great for uh, Capitola Village to be able to, you know, just designate a spot. You guys got a real complicated issue here because parking is a problem in Capitola, but if you ever been to Land's End in England, uh, they park up on top and they all walk down these cobblestone streets where there's all these little shops just like we would be able to in Capitola and uh, these little shops made money off of that but they had specific times they had these barriers they set up for uh, cars and trucks I remember Malk Australia or yeah, melt. They had these barriers that they set up, and they would press a button. The barriers would go down. The trucks would go through early in the morning, deliver everything that they had to deliver. The people had to do what they had to do, and then at seven to seven thirty, the barriers would go up, and it just became pedestrian friendly. And that's when the people would bring out their tables, the the little small restaurants, and all that. And I, what I'm thinking in my mind, what you guys are dealing with is something seasonal. Something that's portable, something that they can, you know, bring out their stuff during a certain time of summer and be able to have some sort of rules as to when, uh, you know, the people deliver and when they don't deliver. Right now in the summertime, I just see people choking on exhaust and waiting in line and trying to find parking places, and it's just not really healthy or not really solving the problem. Uh, you know, these little Capitola kids that are lifeguards, they can walk two, two blocks and get to the beach. Mom doesn't have to drop them off. So, I mean, uh, and basically, I see this. You can set it as a European setting for just a one small area as a test and then try it out. And if it works for the small businesses and for the other people, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's fine, too. But there's got to be rules about when you go in and when you go out. It's, to me, it's that simple. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Hi. I'm Elise. Hi, Elise. Um, love what he said. I used to have a shop in the Mercantile. I closed it down. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, not enough foot traffic. And it was really sad. I had it for three and a half years. And I so support what they <coughs> want to try to do. I think it's really awesome to just bring a little traffic to us and pilot program, just try it out. The one thing I've seen in the time I had my shop, um, when they changed the parking from two to three hours, I honestly see more people parking there for surfing than anything else. Uh, and that, I think, has hurt down there more than what they want to do. Um, I can be very passionate about this. And I think it would just be a... Um, a really awesome thing to give them a chance and try it because if you don't try something you don't know and that's all I have to say thanks Elise hello Ron good evening mr. mayor and members of the council I'm Ron Graves I live in the village or upper village I guess you call it I'm above the trestle but uh, 50 year resident um, I've heard so much 
conversation tonight that I'm not sure, I'm not full up to here, so I'm going to offend some people in the audience. The Mercantile Building is seen from three sides. You just don't see the Mercantile from San Jose Avenue. You see it from the Esplanade twice. Uh, it's been very successful over the years without parklets. You obviously understand I'm not in favor of parklets because until we solve the parking problem down there or get rid of parking altogether down there, which is Dennis's idea, uh, you know, I don't think that this is a good idea. But I want to dispel a couple of myths. In the 1950s, Dennis, I worked for Andy Antonelli. Do you remember that when it was ski ball and the deck had a merry-go-round and a car ride? Well, I worked that car ride in those years, and let me tell you, there's no mystery. That deck was always owned by the, by where Zelda's is now. The only thing that was separate, you remember the little bar and record shop that was right next to the bandstand? That was a separate piece of property, and that was purchased by one of the successive owners to Zelda's. With regards to all this, I don't see how this is going to work for the few summer months where people are going to be able to sit outside. Think about it. It's now 10 minutes to 9 tonight. I know the proposal is for 8 o'clock at night, but on a rainy night, it's not going to work. On a foggy night, it's not going to work. And you know, it doesn't even work for fireworks on fire <laughs> foggy nights, does it? We found that out this year. I just don't believe it's an issue of being able to see the shops in the mercantile. I am in the village every day. I appreciate the parking. I hope that none of this uh, discussion tonight takes away from the idea of parking for the handicapped. <coughs> I'm a handicapped individual, and I use that parking every day. I appreciate your time. I hope you consider this in light of what it is. One last note. The people that own the mercantile, when my wife and I had a business in the village for 13 and a half years, offered us a spot in the, in the mercantile. We evaluated it, and because the rent in the mercantile in those days was triple net, we could not afford to do it. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Anybody else like to speak on parklets? Go ahead and close it and bring it back for discussion. Is there a leader? Um, staff, Michael. If I'm going to understand this properly, it would cost $6,000 initially, plus, because they're diagonal spaces, it would take three spaces to do a parklet. You know, you, you two could Two parallel, three diagonal. You I mean, could do it with two diagonal, but you'd probably have about uh, 10, 10 feet of width. You have about 10 feet about, total. Right? So it's still between ten and $15,000 <coughs> a year. Is that the kind of money we're talking about, charging a business to have that little space out there? I think that would be a policy question for the council if you chose to proceed. You know, if you'd want to subsidize in any manner, um, I know the city of Santa Cruz, they don't charge their parklet operators the parking revenue fees. So that would be an option to make it more attractive. Uh, but certainly if you want a full cost recovery, that, that would be an approximate estimate. Okay. Just a question. Thank you. I'll let Dennis want to go first or last? Well, I'll go first. Okay. Yeah. Before you go, Dennis, I, I, sure. just on that same point, so I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the number is here because I see in the top the permit fee is, I'm going to call that 6000 Sure. One time. And then the rev, that's per space on the bottom. Is it 32 plus the in lieu fee, or is it the 32 a number? It, it would be plus. So the parking so, meter so revenue is what? So let's just call it on the low end. If I said it would be $4,700 per space plus the 6000 So as you $5, said. $5,000 a space. Five, ten, sixteen thousand dollars would be about ballpark for, for two. Okay. Oh, no, um, that's a one-time fee, the six thousand. Right, but I mean, if it was two spaces, it would be five thousand per space, ten thousand plus six, sixteen thousand dollars for two spaces. That that's just my for question. one year. For one year, and another ten thousand the next year. Just trying to, do, yeah. I just want to have an accurate number. That's all. Yeah, I want to be clear that you know staff is putting up sort of all the different types of costs, and what you're seeing in there is. Direct costs, which would be the parking meter lost revenue, because that would be actual revenue that we wouldn't receive. Uh, the other costs are more like in kind. Uh, so those are the costs that 
we would charge staff time to work on the project, for example, associated with the permitting or the in-lieu space, basically the use of the space. We already have those spaces available, and the question is how do you want to attribute, attribute the cost? So this is sort of, if you will, a menu of all the costs. The direct cost up there to the city is the parking meter revenue. The other are either indirect or uh, staff time costs. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Dennis, go ahead. One event in the village is more than this meter kit cost would say. Two days of arts and wine, all the, all the, thing, all the other events we run for the city, the loss of revenue there is much higher than this, this would ever calculate to be. Um, you know, I, I, th I appreciate the analogy of a European village because people who come to Capitola Village and look at it, starting with the Venetian course, look at Capitola Village as being a Mediterranean village. And, um, and commonplace in Colorado and many, many places in, in now in Canada and in Oregon and Washington, streets are being shut down now in certain times of the year to, to make, a, make them feel more human hospi hospitable. And, um, and as you all well know, I've been advocating this for 16 years, that, that you'll never make that village anything more than a giant parking lot until the day that you can shut that village down during the summertime. And if you take a poll of people that live in this town or, or visit this town, I would say 85% of the people would, would say the same thing. Hopefully someday we'll get there. It certainly is going to be in my tenure on the council. Um, you know, and, and giving, you know, uh, hats off to the Planning Commission. I did a very good job with, his, with the zoning update. And, and opening that door to restaurants to stand only works if there's work places to expand too. A 42% 40, expansion for Caruso's doesn't mean anything to him because there's nowhere to expand to. So this gives, this gives that small business and the one next door an opportunity to, sh to share a public space. Remember, this is public space. This is owned by the public, not by the merchants down there. It owns by the bond by the public, and the public pays for it, as they do this lot up here. This is public pays for it. Um, it gives them an opportunity to e economically survive. They're on the edge now. Um, and it also becomes an attraction for that street as it goes down. Not only, not only the mercantile businesses, but the other businesses that are on that street. There's a number of them that... that, that that operate down there, and, and that's pulling people from both ends. Um, this is proposed to be a demonstration project. There's no reason in a year or two years that we can make the determination and say, you know what, this isn't working. We have problems with this, you know, expanding people out. Is there a restaurant that's successful in the village that doesn't have outside seating? And let me, let me tell you which, which ones do, and then you tell me the ones that don't. Um, Batani Arms, Zelda's, Paradise, Margaritaville, Stockton Grill, every single one of those businesses have outside seating. That's what you need to have to be successful in Capitola Village. What we're offering here is to give these two businesses, and they're going to pay the fees, an opportunity to set up a small parklet in front of their business. And yes, um, they won't be able to do, sit out there in the rainy days, no, nor do they do at Zelda's or anyplace else. This is all, excuse me, by weather, and and they don't expect to operate during those t those times outside, but you can, and even you know, not an evening like tonight, but any even in that we saw in, in pretty much in October, they could have operated outside there, and they could operate successful. So, economic vitality. You know, I I, I, I got a stack of, new, of 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 emails and, and, and comments from the, no, the no, normal naysayers that that causes village to never progress or never do anything. This is not expanding or making the village bigger. It's making it a better place for people to be. And it's time, it's time that we open those doors and see if it works. And being a demonstration program, if it doesn't work in the first day, boom, we can take it out. They're the ones that bear the cost of, the, of, of taking a chance with this. And, you know, we, 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 have a, we have a tendency of this council, this council, I'm looking at all of you, a tendency to say no to everything. And that we did it during the zoning orders. We're constantly throwing things out. Anything that's showed change, we threw out small, big, whatever it is. Get bold, council. Do something that, that might be fun and might be good for our community as a change. Give it a chance. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, go ahead. I'll provide a, the opposite point of view for that. I am very sympathetic with all the businesses in the village. It's I know it's it's tough. It's hard to make a living down there um, for various reasons. Um, your rent's too high because you got a crummy landlord. Um, landlord doesn't make tenant improvements. Doesn't you don't you're not doing enough marketing or, or publicity or, or whatever or merchandising or 
you know, it's seasonal, um, weather, um, all kinds, all kinds of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic with, with what it takes to, to try to make a living down there. It's really, really tough. And I think the, the council is very, very supportive. But over the years, we have eliminated parking in the village, and I'm not willing to eliminate any more. I think every time it's come up, I voted against it because the residents down there need a place to park. It's kind of as simple as that. Even though we have fewer residents than we used to have down there, but where do the people in the Quiggies apartments park? Where do the people on Lawn Way park? Where do the people on the apartments on San Jose Park above the former craft gallery, the Zen Shop? I mean, there are people who live down there full time, year round. And so I'm very sympathetic with them and simply not willing to give up any more, any more parking right now. But um, the, uh, I know that the situation's tough at the mercantile, um, but um, you know, with the right kind of merchandise, the right kind of product, the right kind of, 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 um, of publicity and media and, uh, and uh, advertising, you know, that's your best chance. That's your best chance is advertise, 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 and have a good product, and word will get around, and you know you can be successful. So I wish everybody good luck. Thanks, Stephanie. John. So um, this is not San Francisco. This is not Europe. Uh, we have a city that, as Vision Capitola brought to our attention, which we didn't, in a way, need to be reminded. Uh, we have a cute village. But it's a village with limited resources. It's also villages uh, with a lot of well-established businesses that have been here for a long time. And at various times, a lot of vacant storefronts, mercantile and other spots in the village, because they haven't been able to make it for some reason or another. Um, talk a little bit about my experience. I had two, two businesses. And um, it's not hard to see why that is such a difficult way to make a living. Um, there's all sorts of vagaries that affect your business. Um, one was on a great street, San Francisco, Ninth Avenue. Everyone walked past the storefront from the morning to the evening to get to Little Gate Park. We never had a problem. Another one was on Hayes in the Haight-Ashbury. No one walked past us. Eventually moved to the Haight-Ashbury, and it became successful. We were lucky to be able to move because we found a spot. But Capitola has very few spots, especially affordable ones. Um, I'm sort of reminded of when um, Peter wanted to uh, change, uh, Peter Doris wanted to uh, do some expansion at the Mercantile. So being a new guy that doesn't know much about the city, and I fully admit that, I went up and down uh, that area and talked to a bunch of merchants. And I got a couple of comments. And one that's appropriate here is, um, wouldn't it be great if something happened on San Jose? It would really attract people with San Jose Avenue. People would see the storefront. They would come down. And you know, it might make this street. And you know what? I'm going to open up something out to the street on San Jose, because I got the room to do that. And I've been waiting for an opportunity like this. This is a guy that hasn't moved in a long time, but he saw this as an opportunity to make something in San Jose. So a lot of times we make compromises. We try to figure out what's going to work in Capitola. And we listen to the merchants, BIA in particular, because they live there all the time. And sometimes we make decisions that don't go as they have wanted us to. And one that I recall recently is when we extended the uh, parking from two hours to three hours. And that was a big battle. A lot of people didn't want us to do that because parking is a premium. We want people to park, go in our stores, and leave. And so what I did, again, I walked around. I probably visited 8% of the stores in the town. And I heard a whole slew of complaints. I'm getting tickets. My customers don't have enough time to you know, try on the dresses or whatever it is, and they got to run out and they don't come back because they can't find a spot, another parking spot. So we went to three hours. It was a trial period, and we learned a lot in that trial period. We learned that, yes, the city's not getting as much re revenue because we're not giving out tickets. But guess what? We got a lot more happy people 
we're not getting those kind of complaints anymore. And guess what? In that whole time, our sales tax went up. We have indications that businesses were actually doing better downtown. So we have to make decisions here every now and then, and it doesn't always go in line with what the current wisdom is. And my friends here that I've known for as long as I've been here in Capitola are saying, you know, don't give up these parking spots. You know, these, these are precious things, and I totally agree. We made another decision, it was referred to recently, and we made this decision to give up parking spots because Capitola is a place, you know, we got a good break here. There's a lot of guys that like coming down in the morning and, and surfing. So a lot of people came down here and said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we got a special permit so we could surf? And it was brought up that, yeah, there's a lot of parking spots that are taken up by the surfers. So we made a choice that, you know, this is a great city. We want our residents to enjoy it. So we said, okay, surfers should be able to have a chance to get down and do the surfing and not have to park somewhere up the hill, but they could do it down here. Um, my daughter likes Beer 21. My daughter likes uh, Discretions. You know, it's a, a happening spot. And so when I look at parklets, I was just up in Portland, uh, excuse me, Seattle. Those places were great. It added a lot of vibe to the city. I'm from San Francisco originally, born and raised. Out in the avenues, out in the middle of nowhere, they got little parklets. And that's where everything's happening. All the kids are out there studying, whatever kind of businesses, they're always crowded, even on foggy days. If you grow up in San Francisco, you, get, you have to be able to deal with fog. <laughs> Just a matter of course. So if the council decides to do this, and at this point I'm sort of leading that direction, I want to listen to everyone else. I think it should be just San Jose. Um, I'm not too happy about the lights, but maybe in, in reference to the other people that live there, um, maybe that's something important to consider. Um, I'm not against the, the businesses on Monterey, but I'd like to see how it works. I do have some concer concerns about the cost. I do have a problem figuring out, you know, how this is going to be paid for by the businesses. And so I definitely like our plan to give us some help on that and make sure that works. Um, so at this point, I'd like to hear some more comments from um, my other city councilman. Councilman Germany. Okay, no, okay, don't worry. <laughs> I was working the crowd, what can I say? Um, first of all, if this were a proposal to put tables uh, from Caruso's and Cava out on the sidewalk, I'd vote for it in a heartbeat. Okay, it would be a no-brainer for me because I think it fits that whole situation. Um, I'm worried these are the cons, the the scale of the city is smaller than places like San Francisco and Portland, so the number of parking spaces we have to give up are dear. Um, there's the, the tension between residential parking and business parking, which are there are other ways to cure, and that is I've always thought that there should be designated spaces in the village for people who actually live there, like Lawn Way, that no one else can park in. Just an idea. Um, Another con is the Planning Commission was against it. I put a lot of faith in the Planning Commission. Uh, the cost is a concern to me. I think it should be either the parking meter revenue or the in lieu, not both. That's way over the top. Um, and I, I'm really on the I'm really on the fence about this because I think I think it'd be a great thing. I think that you know three spaces per business is not that bad a deal, and really when you think about it, they can be significantly deeper because of the diagonal parking than um, um, the ones down in Santa Cruz. Because Santa Cruz took up parallel spaces. These are diagonal, so they can go out further. I have, um, none like some of my colleagues, uh, no, I don't wet a crying towel for Peter Dwarfs. I don't think any of his tenants do either. So. There are things that could easily change there for the benefit of the tenants, but the tenants never said that, Peter, just me. Okay, I just want to let you know that. 
so I'm I'm kind of in the middle of this. I'm, you know, there are people I really I know and respect, and they came out against this, and and yet there's the idea that we can do something different and something new, and it's a two-year pilot program, and even if we just do uh, $3,200 a year for parking meter revenue and $6,000, that's still 6000 up front and $3,000 a year. That's a heavy bet by a business on the come that, that it's going to benefit them. So those are my feelings. It convinced me more, Mr. Mayor. I don't know. Um. I think this is a great democratic process right here. I think this is a, a request was made to bring up a proposal. Uh, it was put in a public hearing. Public has come in, and it's obviously both sides are well represented on this issue. The question is, there's many you know stigmas that are attached to to the direction. Uh, you know, it's it's a parklet. Okay, it, is that something that uh, makes the village quaint, or is that something that, in some people's eyes, makes it trashy. Um, we've seen parklets. Uh, I believe there's one in Santa Cruz. So there are other cities that have been mentioned. It was mentioned that they have outdoor dining. They have similar type scenarios in uh, in Europe. Some of these parklets that were even shown on the drawing were uh, look like a jungle gym. Okay, so here's that here's that question. You know, what what does this do to the village? How, is it does it enhance it or does it detour? Um, I have a similar concern that, that uh, Mike brought up. You know, I, I'm, I wasn't there when uh, the Planning Commission discussed this topic. I don't know. You know, sometimes when there's a unanimous vote, there's some reason for that. So you have to give that some, some credence. Um, on the other hand, you know, there's there's votes that have come before us that we've overturned that have been unanimous. Um, uh, there was a comment here made that Capitola has a reputation of saying no. There was a there was a gentleman that had the wrong siding on his house, and the planning commission told him he had to tear it all off, and it came to the city council, and we reversed that decision. And I look back at that as one of the best decisions I ever voted on. So uh, I don't think this council says no. I think that this council is one that t tries to take a look at things and evaluate. So um, I'm, I'm with everybody else. I'm, I'm evaluating this because uh, I'm a parking commission guy. Those parking places are, are, they are valuable. There's no doubt about that. I used to live in the village. I used to have to hunt for a parking place in the village. Um, there's one thing that we, we don't give credit to. The planning commission did allow for an expansion of, uh, of, uh, of dining because based on the fact that we did add, people forget this, we did add 232 parking places. Okay, there's been a shortage here for many, many years. And the, by acquisition of the Lower Beach parking lot, 232 places were added. Now, understandably, there was a shortfall that the Coastal Commission had told us of 176 places, created this illusion of uh, 52 extra places. And I don't even want to go into that, whether that's a tangible number. But the fact is, Capitol has doubled its parking that it had in the past five years. When we... Uh, on, an, on, on, a, on a note related to parking, because parking is valuable to me. And we, we just voted to put something in the zoning ordinance that was uh, to do in-lieu parking, and we, and we offered uh, some additional places. I can't remember the number. I'm going to say it was eight, but that could be 10. I'm not sure. And we put an exorbitant fee on that in my mind. It was a fee of $40,000 to acquire those places. And, and my concept was I'm not willing to give those places away, but should somebody want to make an investment to buy those places, I'm willing to let them it's a business venture, and for me personally, I care about the, the, the viability and the financial responsibility I have to the city of Capitola. With regards to these places, um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with the fee. If, if, the, if this is what it costs for us to, to establish a, a program, if it costs, if we have administrative costs, God knows how much time they spent just putting this proposal together to present it. And if a business person wants to come along and take that gamble, because it's definitely a gamble, I'm with you, this is a, this, you know, when you're trying to, you know, make ends meet, and I know that, uh, that, 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 and if somebody says this, it's definitely not true. Life as a business owner in the mercantile is difficult. A lot of the exposures that everybody else has, and, and I believe that maybe the rents are less, maybe they're not, it's none of my business. But I will say that there was a restaurant there called Caruso, still Caruso's today, not a slam, but uh, the guy there named Davide that ran that is, no, is not here any longer because he couldn't, get enough tables out there to feed people when the business was here. And because of that, he's no longer here. And that's a fact. 
and I admire you for running that business. And um, this was not my proposal. This was a proposal brought by another councilman, much like another councilman brought a proposal to have dogs on the beach, and we've had that discussion. And the one good thing about what this council does is it weighs in public comment. And I'm going to tell you, what I heard from the public tonight goes either way. I mean, Dennis brought up some interesting points. We lease some space on, uh, on the patio for the Britannia. We lease it for $350. That's nothing. We lease a trailer that rents surfboards on the beach for, I think it's like $200, okay? We have that. Um, this is $16,000, okay, this is a lot of money. Uh, someone would have to be seriously believed that, that, that it would work for their business. And you know what? I agree, people love to come to Capitola and, and dine outside. And, and what I see in this program is it's a pilot program. Um, and I, I believe that's what it is. It's giving somebody a chance to take a risk and see if it works out for that and whether it enhances the village or deters from the village. And, I don't know that it's our job to get in the way of, of something that may be good for the city. So uh, I'm inclined to support this measure. So if the rest of the council was looking for, um, for guidance or input, or that's my feelings on that matter. Stephanie. Just a, just a general comment. We have to be careful that when we are making public policy, it's not just for one business or two businesses that it really is for the city. And we really need to look at these things and look at them without one business and two or two businesses in mind. But is this really um, going to address a problem that we have and really solve a problem that we have or really forward some issue that we have in the city? And I think um, I'm, I'm, real, I'm not going to support it because, I, as, I don't, as I say, I don't support taking away any more parking when we've already taken away. I don't know how many spaces. I should have added them up, but you know, at least 20 spaces in the village we have lost over the last 10 years, just lost, gone, because of other things that happened. And it hurts. It hurts people that, as you say, when you live there, you try to find a parking place, and it, you know, it's really, really tough. So I think, I think we just need to keep in mind that what we're doing has to be, you have to think of it as being a good public policy for the whole city, and not just we're doing it for one business, the mercantile, or a couple of little businesses in the mercantile, or something like that. That's not a good way for us to be reacting to um, something. If we have a problem like that in the village, we should, you know, with the mercantile, we should take our time and see if there's something really concrete we can do to help them. And, um, uh, you know, visibility is one thing, and the, the mixture of tenants and the, the, the marketing and the advertising and, you know, the whole thing. I don't, you know, I think we have to be careful of putting Band-Aids on things that uh, we may let them have that, but is that, you know, is that going to help anybody else in the mercantile? Who knows? I mean, people may go to that business, but, you know, they see the taffy business. But the problem is trying to get people to walk into the mercantile and to, and to support the businesses there. And that's always been a problem. And we're not going to solve it tonight. But I think if, you know, we want to have a partnership with the mercantile down the road, I think, I think what we, many of us have thought is if they would rebuild their building and have it be more user friendly for the customers with many entrances or doors to the outside or some other walking configuration because just going into that building just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't work. You, you, you get some people that go in there but not enough. So I think the whole thing just needs to be reconfigured. But I, I'm, very, I'm very sympathetic, but I, I, I can't say to a resident in the village, okay, I'm going to take away four, some of your, more, of your parking places. I can't, you know, I can't do that. I, I just want to respond to that real quick. I, I, I think when this came to us, it was a pilot program. And I believe the intent, if I'm not, it was, we were going to offer up to four parking places. Was that what the, what the, the guideline was? That's how the policies currently yeah. drive. And, and, and so it was specifically tailored. I believe when we talk about this, because we only already designated that it's only for Monterey and San Jose. So to say it's not for the mercantile, no, the pilot program was designed if a business in the mercantile specifically, I think it was even mentioned at the day when Dennis brought it up, it likely candidates for this type of proposal would be Caruso's and Cava, should they be willing to enter in to this expensive agreement. So I, I don't think, you know, I can't wait for Peter, if I'm going to wait for Peter DeWars to submit a plan for developing the mercantile, that's not going to happen. Okay, so um, 
like I said, this is not a final decision. This is not binding. This is not conclusive. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that, the, that if it was presented much like the in-lieu parking places uh, that were designated for hotels, no one may take advantage of this. They may decide, you know what, $15,000 is too much money. But if we don't offer something to someone that, that I don't see that it's definitely destructive, okay, it, it's, it's, it's going to take up two parking places. The city is going to receive the revenue for those places. Um, we did add 232 places. I'm willing to take a chance. Dennis? Can I make some, someone small crest? Rich, can you put up the three slides that I gave you? No. If you don't have you can have <laughs> I can get it for you. Okay. okay. Give me okay. a moment. Um, these are actually three parklets in, in uh, outside Portland. And um, oh, I can't. Portland, like like here, is very subject to the weather. It's going to be it's going to be used part of the time. It's not going to be used part of the time. The point is, is it's a it's a point of location that people can identify with in some kind of distance. That there's some kind of activity going on. This is this is a way of promoting economic vitality. And going back, just going back, that this is a demonstration project. If we can see within the first year or two whether it's going to work or not. They're not going to they're not going to, themselves are not going to stay involved in this if it isn't working. But there's no reason why we can't take a small chance here and and put this thing. So I'm going to make a motion that um, we, we, uh, we direct staff to, um, to develop a village parklet program with um, a fair um, fee structure that allows them to survive through the – okay, this is, this is one here that's important. And what's what's common to this, is here's the storefront in front, picture Caruso's in front of the mercantile. And here's your walkout area. It's, it's protected by uh, a railing around the outside. It's, it's flowered. It's, it's umbrellaed. Okay. Is that the only one you got? Uh, that was the only one. We, unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulties on our end. Okay. We do, if you are going to make a motion, I think we have a couple items to, uh, for you to consider as components of your motion. Okay. Yeah, I'd like you to be more specific on that right. fair, whatever, whatever your language was for the uh, fees. Can I speak? He's still up. Oh, he's still up. And then I'll go to you next. Okay. So we, okay. we do on this slide uh, project a few issues that council may want to consider in their motion to make sure that um, we did get the draft policy correct, uh, the application fee amount, whether or not we're going to charge the full cost or offer some relief in that area, um, the annual rate costs, and then some of the draft policy terms that it is indeed going to be a two-year pilot uh, occupying no more than four spaces with no lighting, restricted to San Jose and Monterey Avenues with a nine to nine operation period. And, and so right now we're actually, we're this. discussing just a limited to San Jose Avenue, is that correct? Well, that's and, what I proposed. And, yeah, that's, we're, right now we're discussing a project, uh, uh, the demonstration project <coughs> to San Jose. I'm questioning the lighting issue. I, I'd like to look at that a little farther. I, I'm not so sure that you can operate a serving dinner out there without having lighting, some kind of lighting out there. We could say all solar lights or something like that. I don't know, but, but low, the lighting low level, low level uh, market lights or festoon lights. You know, light bulbs in the end on a string. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, hours of operation are fine. Um, we'll start with four spaces. They're probably not going to want that many because they're going to pay more if they do. Um, and they would do a two-year pilot program. And uh, um, we, I want to discuss the, the annual rate. I, I don't know that an in lieu fee needs to be done in the first two years. I think we're covering the expenses of the city. They're responsible for billing it. They, 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 there should be terms with public works as far as the design of it and making sure not interfering with, with, uh, with drainage. Um, and that's my motion. Um, in a friendly amendment, that the, the fees in, include uh, meter revenue alone, not in lieu fees? Yes. Is that in addition to the permit fees? Well, permit fees, whatever they may be, and we're not sure what they will be, staff will come back with more definitive for I permit think, fees. I think staff's recommendation is, is to, try to, to try to set it tonight. I mean, I think we gave you a range of, of kind of what the direct costs would be in a fully loaded. Can you bring uh, it back? We'll bring that back up. Uh, you know, understand that there are, for example, um, solar projects don't pay any building fees. You know, that's been a decision that the city that – that's not. It's going to be a cost that we're not going to charge. So it's it's you know really a policy call. Uh, the range is in that 
looks like fifty seven to six thousand dollars including a deposit um, that could be the application fee that you set alternatively you could direct another rate it's really your call well, I think we're talking about right now is eliminating the, the in lieu parking fee keeping the parking meter revenue per space and um, and what what it costs in the planning process that can be determined by planning I mean that's is the, the planning process is this going to require coastal permit yeah, well, and it's appealable, and again, that's something that's still going to be need to be sorted out because Coastal Commission staff was uh, not overly excited about it, so it could be at the end of the day they say no way. They're not overly excited about anything. Yeah, so and they're not committal. I mean, I'd rather hear a no than a maybe. Okay. Okay, that's the motion. Just for clarification, the motion is is the permit fees and the the uh, revenue deleting the in lieu parking fee. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, Jack. Okay, um, you know, I'll second it for discussion. Okay, there's a motion and a second. So I'd like to follow up a little bit on what Stephanie said. And, you know, I take to heart what she said. Um, we're, we're making decisions that, in a way, we should think about our decisions as policy decisions that affect the whole city. So. It, it, it's not going, if, if it's successful, it's not just going to be Caruso's and Collins. You know, potentially there could be other businesses that like this idea. So, in general, you know, people want to have other ways to attract customers. They want to have other ways. I mean, if you have a business like a restaurant or maybe even something else. You want to have other ways to seat your customers that are attractive and exciting, you know. And there's a lot of places. Um, there's one that I like in, in, in uh, Santa Cruz. Um, I forget its name. I always go there. But they have little seats out in the front. And my wife and I have no problem sitting there eating our breakfast. People are walking by. Um, because you got that little moment of privacy. You know, people seem to respect that. It's, it's kind of neat about it you know, people eating out in the public. It's just a wonderful thing about the norm of human society. And I, I could see small tables out in front of various restaurants on the mall, I mean, on the Esplanade. I, I could see things like that happening that in my mind would really make our Esplanade a little more exciting. Yeah? I don't know. That's the choice of the person who owns that restaurant. So I'm inclined to go this way because I'd like to see something that sort of mixes things up a little bit, makes it a little bit different. I don't want to get away from the quaint town. I, I want something that sort of organically starts changing, something that the merchants could take advantage of. This is a policy <coughs> that might work. And like it said already, you have the choice of taking advantage of it. So if I was a business and I saw now I have an opportunity to put some tables out on the sidewalk or maybe do something else, because I think we should look at this in, in a broader sense besides the parklets. I have that choice. And I've been in business. I've made those choices. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And that's what it's like being in business. You don't know what's going to work in terms of merchandising or in terms of attracting customers to your business. You try different things. Some work, some don't. So this, in my mind, is not just for Caruso's and for, you know, God, I'm forgetting everything right now. Thank you, Cabas. Um, it's, it's the idea that what are we going to do on a policy level to try to help out our businesses in Capitola, especially in our downtown village. And maybe we will have to make some cho choices between exchanging parking for something that actually helps our businesses and makes this town more exciting, something that can be taken advantage of. And I don't know. But we have to, we have to do an experiment. You know my background. We have to do an experiment. We have to give it a chance to see what is going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen if we don't provide that chance. It may fail, and then we'll pull it back. So I'm going to vote for this. Other comments? Call the motion. 
Mike, are you done? Okay, enough discussion. Motion on the floor. Sue, can we do a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Norton? Aye. Councilmember Harlan? No. Councilmember Botorf? He's last. I mean, Bertrand? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all on edge here, I have to admit. <laughs> uh, yes. Councilmember Termini? Aye. Mayor Botorf? Aye, that motion passes four to one. Good luck with the program. Okay, it takes us to the next item, which is uh, consider amendments to various finance administrative policies. City manager? Oh, Mark Welch, I should have known. I was going to vote for that. I walked in here. Good luck. No, I did too. Did I inspire you? Clearing out the room. Do you want? Do you want it to drop? So figurative, figurative. Figurative. You have to come back to it. Yeah, right. Mayor, members of the council, the next item we're going to look at the financial policies. Uh, just to go over why we have financial policies. Hey, hey. Hold on a second, Mark. We had a little distracted. Just letting the room clear out. Let's go ahead and start now. Thank right, you very much. Ahead. So we're going to look at uh, three financial policies today, administrative policies. So why, why we have financial policies is they're, they're a guide to our financial operations. They guide the city and all the decisions we make in purchasing, collections, uh, financial management, how we issue debt, what, when we issue what type of debt. It's, it's really best practice to review these regularly. Uh, a lot of these policies go back over 10 years. Um, the ones we're looking at today range from four to, four to seven years since they've been reviewed. And the three we're going to look at tonight are financial management, purchasing and procurement, and also collections. So the first one is Administrative Policy 3-3, which is financial management. It really looks at how we manage our annual budget and debt issuance. Uh, the major changes are we're updating language to reflect current practices. There's some reference um, of bringing items back to the City Council during a study session. Since there are not currently study sessions, we removed that language. We've also um, kind of condensed the policy. The current policy gives you the pros and cons of different types of debt. Uh, we're recommending removing that in order to, if there's a time in, in place to issue debt, we recommend we bring all those options back to you guys. We have a discussion and, and lay out the pros and cons at that time instead of uh, in the policy. And the other addition is uh, a section about the PERS contingency fund. So if you remember back in the fiscal year 2015-16 budget, uh, you guys created a PERS contingency fund with $300,000 uh, to help offset future retirement contribution increases. And in part of this policy, and it's actually the next item uh, on the council agenda, is that we take those funds and place them in an interest-bearing trust fund so we can continue to grow that money and use it for retirement benefits in the future. Uh, another uh, policy to be updated is our purchasing and procurement policy. This governs how we procure goods and services, so ranging from the small purchases all the way up to our capital, our large public works projects. Uh, this was updated in 2012. A lot of language has kind of been outdated. Um, it's pretty hard to read, so what we're recommending is Kind of rewriting the whole policy, uh, not many changes to actually what, what we're going to do, but rewriting it so that all the staff can understand it, make it easier um, for everyone. Some of the major changes is we're recommending adding language about uh, a shared project folder for capital projects. Uh, right now, we, we, we collect all the information we need. It's kind of a duplicating of efforts between departments. We're recommending we bring that together, become a little bit more efficient. And if our auditors come in, all the information they would require in one, one spot. We're also recommending that uh, in the future, change orders for capital projects comes through the finance department. Uh, right now, finance reviews it. We're not actually approving it. So by having finance involved, we're able to ensure that we're following the policy. If it needs to come back for city council discussion before it's approved, we, we can make sure those, 
those all happen. We're also recommending that on capital projects we include a 10% contingency. Um, right now the city manager can approve change orders up to a cumulative amount of $25,000. We're recommending that we increase that to 10% of the contract amount if there's budget available for that. Another change is during project closeouts. If the project came in over budget, we're recommending that we come up with funds available to cover that overage. And if the project comes in under budget, we're recommending that we reallocate that at that time to, to other projects. Is that different than we're doing now? Uh, right now, we find available funds. We don't really discuss it. We kind of do it internally, and we're kind of recommending bringing it so if we're, if we're taking money from a certain project, we're identifying that that project is going to reduce funding. I think in many cases we do this too. I mean, I, I can recall a number of times where the bids come in last and we put the money into a sidewalk fund. I think this is formalizing and in, integrating it into our financial policies. That's the key here. What would be the, um, would there be any big ticket items on this? So, I mean, 10% is not very much, but is, are we looking at something that's fifty or $100,000? So, so a perfect example is the current street project. It's a 1.2 million project. So the 10% contingency would be $120,000. And in, in most other jurisdiction, when they bring a project uh, to award a contract, and we do it in some cases, we're kind of saying we should do that in almost all our cases, they'll always throw in a contingency amount of 10%. So you'll award the contract at a million, and then you'll say, and also 10% contingency, because projects run into problems in most cases. Projects do, but purchasing and procurement. So, I mean, we don't see that big of price fluctuations there. It's not, we're not putting something out to bid like a road project, are we? Correct. So, um, will that give us a little bit more control over you know, when we have these change orders? So, so if you review with the contractor, maybe avoid problems. Is, is that sort of what we're going? For? So we'll have a better control over the situation, you know, have an exchange with a contractor and, you know, be better prepared uh, to understand what's going on and make a decision. So, yeah, I, I think what it really does is improve our efficiency as a city. Um, okay. You know, in this street project, $25,000 is a lot of money, but it's minor in terms of the overall project. And so a change order of $25,000 is probably pretty easy to get to. Um, and if we're coming back to council with those change orders every two weeks, you have the potential to delay a project. Whereas if we if we say up front, this is the project amount, we have a 10% contingency, you know, for unforeseen um, issues and cost overruns that maybe happen in the course of the project, then we can improve our efficiency as well. We don't do a lot of $1.2 million projects. Also. That's, that's correct. Is that all the policies? We, the, the last one is our, uh, is our collection policy. The current policy says we'll um, bring to small claims amounts over $250. dollars We're recommending increasing that to $500. Uh, it's pretty staff intensive. The, the cost to file the claim is pretty minimal, but it would require some staff time. So we're recommending increasing that um, after three months at the collection agency. And, and those are the three policies. Any questions? I just have a question, one quick question. It says here you're, you're bringing three administrative policies. Is this three of many that you're going to be bringing us along the way, or you're just, or is this all of them? So the, the first two, the collection policy is pretty minor. The first two are our two major policies. The other policies, I don't see many changes coming, coming oh, for. Okay. All right. I just wondered if you had a stack you were going through and no. you're giving us three at a time. And Okay, good. Uh, anybody from the public like to weigh in on any of these three policies? Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, I don't think you should uh, turn over to the city manager a, a 10 percent. In fact, that would injure uh, negotiation abilities uh, by the city if they know that uh, they can go over uh, budget by 10 percent. I think that's automatic. I think. Uh, because you're our, you know, our representatives that you need to uh, overlook the city manager on, on figures over 
probably your existing probably 25,000. But the excuse for efficiency uh, shouldn't uh, take away your oversight. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public like to comment on these three policies? Maybe the future treasurer would like to make a comment on financial policies. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Peter. My name is Peter Wilk, um, and I'm not the future treasurer. There is there's yet to be an election. Um, okay. Nevertheless, uh, I think that the city manager was hired to 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 do his job, and in and if he's not doing his job, we can get a new city manager. So I believe that we have a competent staff and that if you give them a little leeway, they won't give away the, the farm. They'll, in fact, use that money wisely. And if you can give them a little little leverage, I think, uh, I think they'll do well with your negotiating funds. Thank you for those comments. Not, yeah. oh, hang on a second. Anybody else from the public want to weigh in on that? Go ahead and close the public forum, bring it back. John. Um, I, I guess in terms of um, uh, no secondary source is reasonably available, like on a contract. So h how do we proceed in that case? Um, part of it is notification. Uh, there must be some decision-making process as to maybe the viability of, you know, because reasonable is sort of a broad term. So I was just wondering how you explain that, and is that defendable in terms of contract law? So just just to make sure, um, it's we're talking about sole sourcing of yes. contracts. So uh, we require justification that one, they're the only ones that can provide the goods. There are some products out there and services that there is only one vendor. Um, the other one is sometimes we'll get we'll try and reach out and get three quotes and we'll only receive one back. So in those cases, it would be sole source. And in those cases, we were actually required to the department to send the city manager and myself a memo detailing the reasons why we are doing a sole source procurement. Thanks. So it's documented. Great. Thanks. Any other comments? Two questions. Um, what, if, what are the other parameters for sole source? And I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth right now, being a contractor who has a lot of sole source contracts. My karma will come back to haunt me. Um, what, are the, what are the rationales for sole sourcing? besides only getting one bid on an open bid project? <laughs> um, if you make a finding that the contractor has unique skills or experience um, that, that make um, putting the project out to bid sort of unnecessary, let me get all these words down. Hold on a second. Let me. <laughs> no, we'll get it again. I've used the rationale before. Go ahead. The awarding agency typically makes that call, though. Although I think it's probably worth it to, to put that pitch in your in your bid. If you, every if day. Useful. Yeah, yes. sir, every day. <laughs> and also, do you think that the ten percent um, latitude sends the wrong message to the contractors we have under contract? It was it was a it was a point that was made that is worthy of more, a little more depth and discussion. So, for, for example, on this road project, we budgeted a contingency, the $1.2 million. What was the contingency I'm looking at, a public works director? Was it 25000 So you, we, we do this. We budget the contingency. Honestly, you know, the, I, don't, I don't see a connection between change order requests and budget authority on our end. Um, I've never seen it before. I certainly can imagine a theoretical situation. But with the change orders that we get, they're reviewed through our city engineer, our public works director, through the design engineer. You know, you, you, don't, you don't just authorize a change order because a contractor asks for it. There has to be a specific reason um, for the extra and and justification for it. So I've never Budgetary seen that. Contingency is, is public record anyway at the at the onset, is it not? Th that's exactly right. I mean, okay. yeah. All right, thank you. I, I think I'm inclined to support that because I think the main problem is it normally puts a delay on the project, that, but for us to get back to us and then for us to get through the process and depending on inclement weather, any kind of process that we could be dealing with now, I'm not even sure if this came into play with the Stockton Avenue project, but, but uh, I think delays are the main reason, and it's totally a transparent operation, so I, I don't have a problem with it. So uh, is there a motion? One more question. Oh, go ahead. I read through your, your uh, public financing changes, mm -hmm. and 
They were confusing to say the least. <laughs> I understood about 60% of them. Is there anything in there that will prevent us from, uh, should we be successful with Measure F and decide to bond around a large project for the wharf, is there anything there that would restrict us in any way? There, there's not. So none of the financing mechanisms that would be available to the city were taken out. There was just, I thought, some language in regards to the general obligation bond that really didn't need to be in our policy. Uh, I thought it was just, you know, it's one of those mechanisms that we could use that would be discussed. Um, and which went back and forth from real property to lease improvements and I'm saying, okay, where does where does the, my, my grand plan for the war fall? And it seems like the general obligation bond is where we'd land. So a general obligation bond is, is actually on a property. So it would be a property tax increase. What I think you're looking at would be more of like a revenue bond. Okay. So we're going to we're gonna finance it either private well, uh, through a private placement and yeah. over future revenue sources. Yeah, because the property taxes would not come into play on this. It, Correct. It would be just our future revenue on Measure F. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And so what, what I really want to do is take out the arguments that were in there. Um, there's a couple sentences that I didn't think were proper um, in there. Uh, but really – any, any times that we're going to look at debt, we're going to go out, we're going to go out, see what's available. We're going to weigh the pros and cons. We're going to bring it to you guys for, for your recommendation on what mechanism is proper in that, in each case, each specific case. Thank you. So I'll make a motion. Motion to? I'll make a motion to accept these amendments as proposed by the Finance Department. Thank you. Second by Norton. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. The motion carries unanimously. On to, uh, I believe this is you again, Authorization Participation in Public Agencies Post-Employment Benefits Trust Program. So as everyone's aware, our retirement contributions are increasing pretty rapidly year over year. Uh, back in the fiscal year 2015-16, so the year that we just finished, uh, the City Council established a PERS contingency fund with uh, General Fund had a little bit extra money. They put, you guys put $300,000 into the PERS contingency fund. The idea behind that was to offset two future years of our uh, retirement contribution increases. The, the Finance Advisory Committee at the time looked at options, you know, is creating a contingency fund the right way? Is there other mechanisms available to invest that money, you know, have a little bit better returns in the future? At the time, there was not. Um, since then, PARS, the Public Agency Retirement System, Retirement System. Ha has actually worked with the IRS and received a favorable ruling that they can create a irrevocable retirement trust fund for cities. Um, what it does is we would move our $300,000 that we currently have in the bank um, in, the, in LAIF, the local agency investment fund, returning about 0.6%. We can put it into the, the trust fund. Uh, over the last year, that trust fund returned 3.84%. And what's nice about the trust fund, the way they set it up, is we can actually request to be reimbursed for up to two years of past retirement contributions. So if we came into some financial crisis, um, one of the arguments is, well, you want the contingency funds to pay for those, those emergency-type situations. The trust fund is, will kind of act as that anyways. We'll just be able to refund for our retirement contributions over the past two years. So we're not really tying up the money uh, per se. The other nice thing about setting up the trust fund is it will offset our pension liability on our financial statements. Um, right now, in the fiscal year that just closed, it's close to $15 million. Um, we'll be able to show that we're being proactive and we're trying to address the retirement situation going forward. Um, and uh, another, another argument sometimes is instead of putting $300,000 into the trust fund or save it in the bank, that we should send it to PERS and pay down our liability. Uh, the reason people aren't doing that and everyone's going to kind of most cities are going towards these trust funds is if you give it to PERS, they're going to amortize that over 30 years. So we give them $300,000, they're going to amortize it over 30 years. So we're actually never going to increase our, our, um, our yearly, our decrease our yearly contributions. And so by putting it in the trust fund, we're able to 
earn a little bit more money than we can in our current investments, and we can um, in the future reimburse ourselves for our retirement contributions. Um, so it's, it's a pretty nice nice system that they set up. The one risk is it's is it is an investment, so there is the potential for loss. Um, the the Pars Trust Fund uh, is new, but they haven't had any year over year losses uh, to date. Question: um, uh, If we were put in three hundred and uh, and took out two hundred because we had an issue or something like that, is that a, like a loan we have to repay, or it's just we actually can take it out? Because you said it was irrevocable, so I'm just wondering. So, so it's irrevocable in the terms that once we put it in there, we can only use it for retirement uh, payments. We can't go and say, hey, we want to do a project, we want to do a road project, we want three hundred thousand dollars. We can only use it for retirement uh, contributions. If we, if we took out 100 because we had some issue. And we would not have to repay it. So one, it's, it's kind of like a, it's okay. really kind of a, a bank account that's earning, a, earning more interest. It, it's restricted only to paying your CalPERS costs, but we have far more than $300,000 of car, CalPERS costs every year. So yeah, 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 yeah. you, got you would it. always utilize it. You, you, you always can utilize it in any given year. If it was $6 million, then we... We're still in trouble in that regard. Yeah. And so uh, in terms of the funding goal in this trust fund, the recommendation is that we, over time, we have no time period to do this, but invest one year of our retirement contributions, which is currently $1.2 million. Like I said, we don't have a time frame. We're not saying we want to get there in 10 years. But ideally, if we could, it would be nice to have one year of retirement contributions in the trust fund uh, in case of emergencies in the future. And additional contributions above the $300,000 would be made from fund balance as the city council authorizes. What kind of emergency would there be if we're looking at people retiring? You, you know, like, like, if, like if 10 people or 12 people retired at the same time, that would be the emergency. So I, it, when I, I'm saying emergency, I should probably say, um, like if we have an economic downturn and we see our revenue crash like it did in the last recession, our sales tax, we could actually go to this trust fund and pull out a year of contributions. But you, so Jamie we can said you can only use our, it for retirement. You can pay our contributions. Our, and our you can retirement. reimburse yourself. So we're, we're right now at $1.2 million contribution. So if we had $1.2 million in the trust fund and we needed to pull the money out, um, you know, we're seeing decreasing sales tax or revenues way down, we can pull it out and reimburse ourselves for the past two years of our contributions. Hey, hang on a second. Do you have a question, Michael? Good. Good. Um, by the way, the Finance Advisory Committee did review this, and um, I think there was a motion to uh, recommend it to the council. Correct. Contrary to that, we are still giving our money to the state to kind of hold on to. Make me feel good about the fact that they won't just take it because they can. So, so PARS is actually a separate entity. It's not part of the state, and they allow local control. So they have different investment options. They have five different uh, targets from very conservative to aggressive. Uh, they recommend you stay down on, you know, the more conservative type investments. Lower returns, you know, the risk is a lot lower. Yeah. But it is a separate entity. PARS is a separate entity from the state. Thank you. And so the staff recommendation is that you authorize staff uh, participation in the, the city's participation in the PARS Retirement Trust Fund and that you appoint the city manager as the plan administrator for that trust fund. Any other questions? What does the city manager get to do for that lofty title, besides have more work? Sign the documents. Yeah. Anybody from the public like to weigh in on this potential uh, plan? Gary. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, we noticed all these recommendations are coming from the uh, city manager. Uh, the last one killed your negotiation power and the incentive to increase cost and also creates a way for kickbacks um, from the contractors. On this one here, you're authorizing the city manager to negotiate, but not only negotiate, but to execute and implement the program without your oversight. Again, maybe we should be voting for the city manager and have you guys as the consultants, but in every way and 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 action seems to be giving the authority away uh, uh, to the, uh, you know, administrators rather than uh, protecting your constituents. And I'm also upset that the uh, 
uh, city manager uh, uh, perverted uh, the minutes. It's different on a consent calendar or a regular calendar that people, if, if they're addressing the council, they know what the topic is. On oral communication, there's no indication. There was a little lady here, Marilyn Garrett, was concerned about microwaves, and um, she was here last week. Her name isn't on there. I was here at the last meeting also. My name's not on there. So you've misrepresented the minutes to your city council, and I expect an apology on that. Thank you. That was the, that was the meeting of October 13th, which hasn't come to council yet. Okay, great. Thank you for that uh, clarification, sir. Appreciate that. We, we were here. Okay. Uh, anybody else from the public like to weigh in on the PARS? Okay, with that, uh, do we have a motion and a second? Move staff recommendation. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Takes us to um, item E consider amendments to administrative policy. 1-7 regarding the memorial program. Is this uh, public works or city manager? Oh, Larry, I'm sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Let me, I'm going to open up the document first. I'll be right okay. Oh. Thank Sorry, computer problems. While we're waiting, Mike, did you talk about the artwork last week that I missed the oh, meeting? This is if new not, art. would you please introduce this lovely artwork that we have in the council chamber? It's new, art, that, right, new artwork from the middle school, and Ray Segura, who is the art teacher at the middle at New Brighton Middle School, brought this to us from his current class. It's a very interesting study. He has the students draw things that are just laying on a table, just random objects, arrange them and draw it with a pencil. Draw That's them and wonderful. I they're, they're just remarkable. These yeah. are these are young teens. These are middle school students. It's fabulous. Well done. Amazing. Really nice. They're yeah. fabulous. Yeah. I, I have asked Mr. Segura to, to see if his students could come out to the next meeting. To oh, good. Good. Even better. Thank you. Larry. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. We're ready. Okay. Memorial program. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, I'm here to talk about our memorial program. Um, the Memorial Bench Program was begun in 1993. It was designed to help um, fund benches along the Esplanade. Um, in 2002, a formal policy was created, and other locations such as the Wharf and Depot Hill plaques have been added. Um, currently, all Ocean View benches are taken. There are none available. Um, acceptable like Wharf locations are also full. Right now, Depot Hill railing is the only place where there's actually plaque space. Um, in addition, there are benches available in, in some of the parks. Um, so what we did was we, we kind of looked at the policy. Um, we modified the language of the policy to clarify that when you purchase a memorial item, it isn't in perpetuity. There, when it is no longer maintainable, when it is broken, um, at that point, the, the original agreement is over. And, and to be honest, the, the policy did state that. It was pretty clear. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't always um, clear to the applicant. So what we've also done is we've made it so during the application, the, the applicant has to agree to these, these statements. So a perfect example is when a, when a uh, bench at the Esplanade is no longer usable. Um, the, applica or the, the, the owner of the plaque has the ability to purchase a new bench and keep that plaque. And it's the, the secondary cost would be really a, a lower cost, really the, the physical cost of the bench rather than including the maintenance and other things as they did originally. If they don't want to do that, then it goes, is open again for others. Um, you give them the plaque then? Yes, absolutely. They, they would get the plaque back. Um, anytime there's an issue where they, they, they if the plaque, like we have, we have a couple where the plaques are, relatively unreadable, um, we have to go, we're going to have to go back and research to see who, who they were to see if they want to replace them at that point. Um, in addition to that, um, we've also added the new McGregor and Rispin Parks to the program. Um, currently at McGregor, we have a few benches and we've had some, you know, inquiries about it, so we've added that. Um, the Memorial Tree Program, we, we removed from the policy. Um, 
I, I made a mistake in the um, staff report. I had actually said we hadn't ever had an application. It turns out we did actually have an application. I don't have record that it was actually followed through with. So I'm going to go find that. But that in that was eight years ago, and it's it's a it's a, the the staff isn't exactly sure where and when those would go in. So at this point, we figured it was better to to kind of focus on what people were interested in. That's the benches and the plaques. Um, we've also removed the location list and the application from the policy due to the fact that it, it gets updated all the time. The, the, the application and the, and the fees are included in the fee schedule. So at that point, every year the, the application will get updated and the, the fees will reflect the, the numbers in the fee schedule. So with that, I'm um, open for questions. Yeah, nice question. Thank you for doing that. I, I, I'm the one that asked to have this thing back because clarify forever is a long time. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> In fact, they're having a problem with, with the cemetery you're already working on, people not uh, keeping track of it. The, um, the handrails on the wharf, let's say we have a storm, we lose the handrails. Yes. Is, their plaques are gone. They're, that's, that's just gone. They, they have gone. realized that. Okay. that that's okay. correct. Okay. There, there's in a category you have in here that, it, that, is, that it's not in here. Oh. That is the streetlights. We, we actually dedicated some streetlights. As, as I've been told, that that was done as, along with the bricks through the Chamber of Commerce. Oh. That, that, those, okay. those, okay. that's, is, that, yes, that, that is oh, what, okay. that, I, we found out about that, and I was like, why isn't it there? And that's exactly why. Um, okay. You know, we, we, def, we, at this point, I don't know if we have any more street lights, but that was a relatively recent project. So can the Chamber of Commerce go out and sell those? Um, no. I don't think there are any more that we own. No. I think the rest of them don't belong to us. Right. Oh, they're all owned by pg &E? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm, I really didn't get why you want to uh, get rid of memorial trees. So in Noble Gulch Park, there is um, five memorial trees planted behind the bench. And um, I don't know if those, I, I don't believe those are actually the memorial <laughs> trees, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I, I was told what those I asked, were, they were, told they were, to they were, they were for council members. Yeah, they that, represent okay. council members. Right, that, I don't believe that was done through the program. That was done outside the program because we I, let's put, we, I don't have any documentation or any folders. The only I found one tree actually through this program, memorial tree um, application was in 2008. And I haven't been able to trace that it was actually completed. But yes, you're right. There are four trees. But one I was do, cut down. Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> so it should be five. Okay. One of our trees was cut down. <laughs> the mayor tree. The mayor tree. The mayor tree. <laughs> Well, so, it, it, it was just the fact that it, 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 no one was asking for it. Um, so well, obviously, it, if you know, and and it is is a different application because each one of those. I mean, if 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 people were asking for it, we we wouldn't have done anything. But it is a little more tricky because it does come to council to figure out if the place is appropriate, the trees appropriate. So it's a little little different of process, and um, so I could still get a memorial tree. The, the the other factor I might add about about the memorial trees is that the city already we already collect fees for trees so we already have a tree fund um and at this point i think as a city we would if there was a good location to put trees we're going to put trees in already so we don't necessarily have a bunch of spots where it would be nice if someone would give us a couple dollars to put a tree in if we have a good spot for a tree we'll put a tree in so it seems like a program that probably doesn't make a ton of sense. The plaques, I can see. The benches, obviously, support developing benches. The trees, we don't need any help with trees. We have plenty of money to put trees in. We just need the locations. So, where do you get the money from the tree to have the tree fund? Uh, has to come uh, tree permit, tree re removal, removal permits. permits. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're actually going to have quite a balance in there, and you may this next year see a program proposed by staff to help move that program forward. Actually. Okay, I, I, I personally don't have any problem with memorial trees. Um, it's not a no question of having a problem with the memorial <laughs> trees. I think, just to be clear, it's just the problem, you know, we don't need another funding source. And if we have a site for a tree, uh, talk to us and we'll get a tree in there. Is it really something we want to administer? And, and then, yes. <laughs> Anybody could have their own memorial tree. It isn't like we had to have a, a well, recognition by the city that it's a memorial tree. Well, I think what Larry says, it, it goes through a complicated process. And if if for some reason it's really important to that person and they're willing to go through the process. Well, uh, and, and obviously, we, you know, it, historically, uh, it, there just hasn't been the demand for it. That's, that's all. I mean, it's been on the application for, 
since 2004, I believe. Um, no. But you know, it was just seen as something that staff hadn't been doing, so we thought we it would be better to take it out if it wasn't something that uh, people were interested in. If there is a surplus money in that tree fund, I'd like to see uh, larger palm trees replaced on uh, Capitola Avenue across from Bella Roma if, if there is a surplus of money there. So. Steve, <laughs> thanks. Any, I'm going to park lit there. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I wasn't allowed in that. Wait, wasn't allowed in that location. Like, okay. Is there is there really no more room for plaques on the top rail of the it, wharf? On I, both I, sides? I I think I need to be acceptable. There are places, but they're behind fences. They're behind the 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 the, the businesses. No, I'm and, talking about on the wharf. Yes, on the wharf. That's correct. They're behind, behind the, the, the fence. Um, they're behind the businesses and. Yes, there, the, the, the concern is, is if someone goes to put one there, they may be fine with it. But someone else in that relative, you know, say someone comes to see it, they have to go behind the, the, the bait, boat and bait to find it. They're like, well, why is my... Well, no, certainly know, there's room for at least two on each section of top rail. Well, okay. well right now, the, the policy right now is, is in, in the approved numbers was one for each top rail unless they were related. You know, if there was a family, then they allowed two. And the, 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 we, we hope that if they're going to do that, well, right, it's not so an issue. But right now, we are directing those folks, take a look at Grand Avenue. There is space up there. Um, truthfully, the, the, the ocean view thing is pretty, most people that um, want it, that's where they want to be able to go out and see. And people have come back and uh, applied for the Grand Avenue after seeing that. Um, there are definitely some folks with a with a tie to the wharf. Um, the concern with some of the possible spots are, they're just not. It's not really fair to put someone behind. If my children place. come to you, you can put me behind the porta potty. It's okay. So, <laughs> well, I'm gonna go on the record. As well. okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? That completes your presentation. Anybody from the public want to weigh in on this? Come on up, Bob. Has anybody ever been to Kauai? Kauai? Yeah. I'll go yes. Go ahead. Okay. You ever been to the Cocoa Palms? It's not there. The hurricane took it out. Are you talking about the rebuild? Right. Uh, no, not the rebuild. Okay. Um, they used to have an incredible tree, uh, celebrity tree thing, uh, where you'd walk through their gardens, and all of a sudden you stumble upon a tree with a nice, beautiful black brass plaque plant planted there by really neat people like John Kennedy, King of Saudi Arabia, King of Iran, they actually stood there and planted it. It gave you the feeling of, wow, almost, you know, sacred ground here. Now, I know we don't have those kind of celebrities in Capitola, but why not offer in the Rispin Park, forget, you know, all the other parks. Rispin, you've opened up Rispin, i got to assume that you did away with the uh, benches, or not the benches, the tree program, Prior to Rispin entering the deal, right? Or am I wrong? Um, well, it's it's part of the the same amendments but, today. Uh, okay. So we don't we didn't add any trees at Rispin for this. Okay. So uh, opening up the Rispin as a park or whatever it is, uh, there's a lot of land there. Let people plant a tree in memory of whoever or for whatever. To have a uh, that would probably be a much longer lasting uh, thing than than a park bench which I'm sure you could have more park benches in Rispin, uh, but something about a tree, it's a living thing. It's kind of like you're giving that opportunity. I mean, I envision a day when I walk the grounds of Rispin and I come upon Dennis Norton tree. That, you don't know the warm, fuzzy feeling that gives me. Well, that's all the reason to put it back in. <laughs> But I think, you know, for those who have been to Cocoa Palms, it, it's a neat experience to walk around the grounds and realize that those people actually stood there. It would have been great to have some old people in, in Capitola uh, plant trees there. It would be kind of neat to see their names. But, uh, you know, we've got some interesting people here now, and I think it would be a good opportunity to take advantage of that and charge for it. What the heck? Um, anyway, it would be one more interesting thing also for people to come to that park, you know. I mean, I'd come and see Dennis's tree. I'd even water it. Maybe you feel like it. No, it's looking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Peter, did you want to speak on this topic, or are you just readjusting there? 
Okay, come on up. I know you have a vested interest in Peary Park. There so are maybe many interesting some... people in Capitola, and most of them are in this chamber right now. It's really... I know you want to keep this meeting going and going. So, no, I just thought you had a comment. Um, just an oddball thought, and that is I go down the wharf, and it seems kind of morbid with all these plaques <laughs> of dead people. <laughs> and it, to me, it's like, I don't know, was this Capitola Cemetery, this village? I mean, there's... An awful lot of plaques on benches. And, I don't know. It's Peter just... goes farther than that. We got a seawall full of family <laughs> dedications. We got bricks in the village. We got on every handrail, on every bench. It is. Hey, you, know, you know what, Peter? It's a good point. And, and at some point, much. you got to cut off the memorials. At some point, you got to cut off the murals. You know, they're just there's. I like the murals and I like the. At bricks some point, instead. I just said at some point. Peter, let me let me give you a, a quick anecdote. Many years ago. Um, Ron Gray's wife received a flood of phone calls giving her condolences because the mem people in Capitola, when Ron retired from the council, bought him a plaque for a bench on the wharf, and all of a sudden everybody thought he had died. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, it's a cemetery. <laughs> okay, anybody else from the public? Going once, I'll close that down. Do I have a... Uh... I'll make a motion. Go ahead, Jack. Okay, um, so I'd like to move the staff recommendation um, on the memorial program, but to uh, pull back the, uh, put back in the memorial trees. Second. Any other discussion? Couldn't hurt. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Trees are in. Okay. Um, Larry, I love it's the oral communication when, you, when you're finished. You know what? I'm at the end, so before I adjourn, Stephanie, go ahead. Well, all this talk about trees reminded me of something I wanted to tell the council members about. A really good friend of mine, friends of mine, live on 15th Street in San Mateo, which runs from El Camino uh, to the railroad tracks where the um, well, the Caltrain goes. Mm -hmm. That that area, lovely, um, a residential neighborhood, very very nice uh, older homes, mostly in the, from the 1920s and 1930s. Well, uh, my friend that lives there decided to uh, try to have a beautification project, and he went to the city and he said, "Now, can we um, plant some trees and have a theme on our street?" And it's kind of like Lower 41st Avenue, where it's the same type of jacaranda tree or whatever. It's, I mean, it's really stunning when they're when the trees are in and when they're in bloom. And so he had to go down to his, it's a, I think a two block area. And so he had to go to all of his neighbors. He said it took him two years to get their permission for where they were going to put it. And in many cases, they could put it where they had dirt along the sidewalk. But in some cases, they had to jackhammer out the, the, uh, the sidewalk, uh, not the sidewalk area, but the, the uh, cement part of it to plant it there. But what, and then, and then the city said, well, we're going to, we're, uh, we're, we'll give you the tree, but we're going to, charge you for the jackhammering and, and the installation. And then everybody got so excited about it, and the city got excited, and they had extra money in their tree fund. They gave the neighborhood these trees, and they also ended up not charging them. The city crews came in and jackhammered and made the holes and planted the trees, and now they're there, and they're just baby trees. But they are going to look beautiful when that's yeah, done. Yeah. And he said it took him two years, but it didn't end up costing anybody anything except him. But I thought that is a wonderful community project. And, and it doesn't really fit with anything we're doing in Capitola, but years ago we did talk about planting trees. And somebody was going to give us some trees. And so I think if we ever have that opportunity again where we see that there's a need for some trees in a park or somewhere, I think that um, we could probably get people to donate them to us, probably, or it'd be worth spending the money from the tree program in there to, to try to beef up our um, our. Uh, we don't we don't need to become Tree City USA, which I know a lot of cities are. They've done that, and that's really a neat program. But we don't have to have anything official. But if we get that, room just remind me if we if they have the opportunity to plant some more trees, let's do it because it just makes can make a huge difference in a in an area it makes it look so beautiful this, this was a beautiful street on 15th and it had a few little trees but not much but it's gorgeous now really nice, so nice. yeah so, okay Mr. Mayor. yes a week from this saturday uh, the plein air event is in capitola That's right Thank all you. day saturday artist painting in the city on sunday new brighton middle school multi use room we'll have the reception and the judging so come one, come all, rain or shine, it'll be great. <laughs> and as already said, uh, remember November 1st for the Capitol Historic Museum. Have at dinner the at the Shadowbrook first at, at 5 or 5.30 and then go yeah. to the library meeting. Support the library. We will have um, 
also refreshments. This is a wonderful event. Okay, with that, Capitol, we're adjourned. Good night.